Okay, members, you're very welcome to this meeting of the Education Committee. Can I advise members that the committee is in public session, even though the public gallery remains closed to visitors? Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members into the spotlight for the next four items? Agenda item one is apologies. Can I ask if anyone is aware of any other apologies? No. Nope. None received. Okay. Thanks, Clerk. Agenda item two, then, members, is chairperson's business. Uh, can I first and foremost welcome uh, our new member of the committee, Nicola Brogan, MLA. You're, you're very welcome, Nicola. Um, would you like to uh, have an opportunity to introduce yourself, or are you, you content to see how we get on today? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Oh, no, I'm looking forward to getting started within the committee. Um, I plan carrying on the good work that Catherine Kelly has done within the committee, and look forward to working with all the other members. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, you're, you're, you're very welcome. Catherine made an important contribution. We look, we look forward to inviting you to, to do the same. Um, you'll have, I'm sure you'll have seen we've dealt with a wide range of extremely important issues over the last while, and, and we look forward to continuing to do so. So you're very welcome. Thank you. Agenda item 2.2, members, is the integrated education briefing. Can I remind members that at the briefing on the 25th of November, a number of questions arose in respect of the definition of integrated school and the nature of mixing in schools, and also in respect of the certificate in religious education. Can I seek members' agreement to invite the Integrated Education Fund and the Ulster University UNESCO Centre to brief on these matters in the new year? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank Agreed. you. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 2.3 is in relation to suspension and expulsion. Can I remind members that the Department of Education is undertaking a review of suspension and expulsion, um, I think it's also referred to as exclusion, Clark, as well, in schools, and la that last week uh, it shared a copy of its 2004 report on the same subject. That report indicates that some uh, schools at that time did not have an expulsion or exclusion scheme, which is a legal requirement. Other schools viewed pre-expulsion and exclusion consultations as a formality. They are also a legal requirement. There was inconsistency in the application of suspension and expulsion and exclusion arrangements in different sectors, and there were no operational targets for providing alternative education um, for excluded pupils. Also, delaying tactics were used by some schools, uh, it seems, as a way of avoiding offering a place to an excluded pupil. Can I remind members that the committee has already asked about the terms of reference for the new review and seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education seeking clarification as to whether anything else has been done in the meantime to address the issues set out in the 2004 report? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item 2.4, members, is procurement in schools. Can I remind members that the Finance Minister made a statement on Tuesday, the 1st of December, regarding procurement? During the statement, there were multiple references to poor procurement practices in education, in particular schools being obliged to make use of expensive contractual arrangements <coughs> and undertake low-level maintenance. Can I seek members' agreement to write to the Education Authority seeking clarity on the level of delegation that schools currently enjoy in respect of this kind of work and what plans the Education Authority has to improve this situation. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Can I, agenda item three, members, can I refer you to the draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 25th of November at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item four, members, there are no matters arising. Okay, and that takes us to agenda item five, uh, our briefing from the Department of Education on the Special Educational Needs Framework, and in particular the consultation on new regulations and code of practice. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and add the witnesses? And can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 14, a departmental briefing paper at page 28, a copy of the consultation documents and equality screening at page 38, 
other papers, including a draft simplified guide to the SEN code of practice from page 128, and in table papers, a commencement order relating to section 1 of the SEND Act, which is at page 155. Can I welcome then Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education, Sharon Lawler, Head of Special Education and Inclusion Review Team at the Department of Education, and Jan Matthews, Special Education and Inclusion Review Team at the Department of Education. By way of welcome, officials, can I say that the Education Committee has obviously dedicated significant time in recent months and years to considering issues relating to the provision of special educational needs. Um, we've heard uh, a lot about late statements and varying levels of support for vulnerable children during and after the first lockdown. The new SEN framework is therefore of significant interest to the committee for now and uh, into the future um, when education uh, returns to uh, a, a new normal. Can I advise officials that the committee will give you 15 minutes to make your opening statement uh, in which we'd like you to discuss the background to the new SEN framework followed by question from members. And can I hand over to Ricky Irwin at that point? members of the committee um, and thanks very much for the opportunity this morning to provide a briefing on the consultation on the draft at SEN regulations and the SEN code of practice. So at our briefing on the 11th of March to the committee we provided you with an update with regard to the new SEN framework and today I'll focus on the draft regulations and the supporting draft code of practice and we'll update you on our plan next steps. The paper you received to accompany this session today provides more detail about the consultations themselves. So the focus of the new SEN framework is on inclusion, early identification and assessment, leading to interventions designed to ensure that children and young people with SEN have access to the special educational provision they need, when they need it, and that this is underpinned by clear understandable information. The SEN regulations and the SEN code of practice are essential building blocks of the new SEN framework. The new SEN regulations set out the detailed processes to support the SEN primary legislation and the new code of practice sets out practical guidance for schools, the education authority and others for identifying, assessing and making provision for children who have SEN. Another key element is awareness raising and training for schools and others in the new SEN framework. So ahead of our briefing today, members have been provided with a paper which gives some detail on the consultations, as well as a synopsis of the main content of the SEND Act 2016 and the main changes between the SEN regulations which the department published for consultation on the 30th of September this year and the version on which we consulted in 2016. The SEND Act 2016 provided the department with new powers to make regulations which combined with the existing powers Sorry to cut across you. Could I, could I just ask everyone other than uh, the person giving evidence to make sure that their devices are muted? There's a fair amount of background noise during Ricky's presentation. Thanks very much, Ricky. Thank you, Chair. The SEND Act 2016 provided the Department with new powers to make regulations which, combined with the existing powers, have been used to develop the draft regulations currently out for consultation. These powers include to prescribe the experience of the Learning Support Coordinator, arrangements and timescales for mediation with the EA about appealable decisions, and they also include powers to make provision about assistance and support to enable a young person to exercise their own rights in the SEND framework and for those young people who lack capacity to avail of help from others. The new regulations that emerge from this consultation will be brought first to this committee for scrutiny and then onward to the assembly floor through affirmative resolution. This was an important inclusion in the SEND Act which gained royal assent in March 2016. So we've taken the opportunity afforded to us to really concentrate on what was not working 
and indeed how we could change the draft regulations to improve things. So with this as our mantra, we have made considerable changes to refine and finalise the regulations in liaison with the Departmental Solicitor's Office. A synopsis of the new draft regulations at a very high level, summarising the main changes since 20, the 2016 consultation version, has been provided at Annex B to the written paper which the committee received. And I'll just single out some of the main changes from that. So firstly, the, the statutory time frame for the EA to make an assessment and if necessary make a statement has been tightened from 26 weeks to 22 weeks. In the 2016 consultation version, it was 20 weeks, which included a four weeks turnaround for health and social care trusts to provide their advice. However, we listened to feedback from those trusts and changed this back, <clears throat> this back to six weeks in absolute agreement with them that four weeks would not work. We've made an improvement to the 2005 SAN regulations, which do allow exemptions to the time limits, both for the EA and the trusts. While the draft regulations still permit these exemptions, they importantly introduce upper time limits by which the EA must absolutely complete each step in the statutory assessment process. And this represents a sea change improvement, and we hope will bring an end to statutory assessments taking longer than they should. The SEND Code of Practice has been drafted to reflect the SEND Act provisions and those contained in the 1996 Education Order, as well as the new draft SEND regulations. And once finalised, <clears throat> the new code will replace both the 1998 code and the 2005 code supplement. It will provide statutory guidance on how the legislation will work in practice for schools, the EA and other partner bodies such as health. A key driver in the development of the code has been the 2017 Northern Ireland Audit Office report on SEN, which recommended that the department and the EA should ensure that schools apply a clear and consistent approach to identifying and providing for children with SEN. And with this in mind, the code sets out individual rules and responsibilities and offers step-by-step -step guidance for addressing the needs of those children who have or may have SEN. This is supplemented by the use of practical flowcharts, checklists and summary information that will be a go-to resource for schools during the process. Parts of the draft code have been developed in collaboration with a range of stakeholders, including schools, the Education Authority, Special Educational Needs Coordinators, or SENCOs, the Education and Training Inspectorate, and other statutory and non-statutory organisations. Some key aspects included in the new code include uh, the new three stages of special educational provision, which will replace the existing five stages. And the three stages <clears throat> include special educational provision by the school, school plus support from the EA, such as services provided through its plan of arrangements for special educational provision, and finally additional provision through a statement. Guidance for the EA about the production of the new annual plan of its arrangements for special educational provision aimed at contributing to a more open and transparent approach to how the EA determines the same services it will provide and what services are available and importantly how to access, access these services. And this plan will also detail the training that is available for school staff. Also in keeping with the new cooperation section in the SEND Act, the code emphasises that there needs to be greater cooperation between the EA and health and social care trusts in the areas of identification and assessment of children who have or may have SEND um, and provision for children who have SEND in the transition planning for children aged 14 and over who have a statement. There will be detailed information about what will be entailed for the new role of the Learning Support Coordinator, which replaces the SENCO role. There will be support uh, that children over compulsory school age can have to exercise their rights, uh, and there will be guidance for schools uh, in preparing, reviewing, and maintaining a child's personal learning plan, or PLP, which will be held electronically in a secure system and guidance on sharing the PLP and asking for and recording consent to share and not sharing the PLP if consent is not provided. <clears throat> and this will replace the existing individual education plans or IEPs, which are not at all standardised 
and are held in many and various formats at present across schools. The department recognises the importance of investing and training for schools to help introduce the framework and to support its implementation. As such, we have funded the setting up of a SEND implementation team in the EA, and since 2017-18, we have provided $7.1 million to the EA to prepare for the implementation of the new SEND framework. This team has already delivered a significant awareness and training programme to school principals and SENCOs, and further training is underway and planned to ensure that both the EA and schools are ready to implement the new SEND framework. For the 1920 financial year, the funding provided to the EA SEND team was 2.5 million, and this includes necessary subcover for attendance at training work back in school. In this financial year, we have also provided 7.5 million to schools directly in preparation for the new SEND framework. And it's especially important to support SENCOs, who, as I've already mentioned, will be known as learning support co coordinators under the new framework. We want the school to ensure they have the time off the teaching timetable to do their jobs. I've already mentioned the PLP, and specifically the department has worked with nursery, primary, post-primary and special school SENCOs to co-design the new standardised PLP electronic templates, which will, be, which will be implemented as part of the existing school information management system, or SIMS. So before moving to the next steps, I'd just like to highlight the, the rising challenges for SEN, which, which you will know, of course. During the last 15 years, the education sector has seen a huge change in both the numbers of children being identified as SEN, <clears throat> from 53,000 in 2004-05 to currently 67,000 in 1920. The numbers of children with SEN being taught in mainstream settings um, <clears throat> the latter increasing significantly from 14% or 48,000 of the total enrolment in mainstream to currently around 18% or approximately 61,000 in 1920. We do recognise the implementation of the same framework will bring associated increased pressures for schools and we've highlighted a £30 million pressure as part of the ongoing budget 2021 information gathering exercises. This pressure relates to funding for the new learning support coordinators and for the creation of the new PLPs required for every child on the school's SEN registers. It recognises that schools do not currently receive any specific funding for the special educational provision for children at the current stages one to four, and they also have to fulfil their responsibilities for children with statements. So in terms of next steps, as we progress through the consultations and the briefings, officials will <clears throat> listen to what stakeholders have to say. And once all the responses are received, detailed analysis will begin in order to identify any changes required to the same regulations, and we will engage with our departmental solicitors. We plan to present to the committee again uh, in the spring to provide an update on the responses to the consultation. Our analysis of those responses and the, detailed, uh, uh, the detail of those proposed changes. I must mention that we have already been told by some key stakeholders that they will wish to reply, <clears throat> but they, have been not, they may not be able to do so by the 22nd of December, which is the current closing date, and it's highly likely that we will receive responses um, after that period. Careful consideration of the timing of the commencement of the provisions in the SEND Act 2016 is required. In the main, for practical purposes, these can only be commenced when all the building blocks of the new SEN framework, that is, the SEN regulations and the SEN code of practice, are in place. As you will have read in the paper issued to you ahead of this briefing, we're planning to commence the views of the child duty very soon. So commencement of Section 1 does not depend on the new SEN regulations, and as such, there are no barriers to its commencement. So in conclusion, Chair uh, and committee members, we look forward to establishing a productive working relationship with the committee as we move the same regulations, the same code of practice and the commencements forward. These legislative are an essential element in the overall reform of SEN services, which is much needed in order to improve the learning experiences of, of some of our most vulnerable children in Northern Ireland. The new regulations and code of practice will enable and underpin 
the operational changes which the EA is currently implementing in response to the many reports and recommendations which have been recently published in the area of SEN. So, Chair, members of the committee, I hope you find that useful. Uh, and myself, Sharon, uh, and Jan will be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ricky. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep the witnesses in spotlight and to bring members into the spotlight uh, when they are asking questions? And invite uh, Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA, to ask a question. Thank you, uh, Ricky, Sharon, and Jan, for uh, joining us this morning, and Ricky for that update. See, Ricky, see, in relation to the uh, tw 26 weeks going down to 22 weeks, and we know that over the summer period, um, that that doesn't be included. You know, so you, you, you lose eight weeks. Um, is there any proposals around changing that at the minute? Um, so. The 22 weeks, Karen, um, is, is, is the fixed time frame. So we have the fixed time frame at the minute of 26 weeks. The 22 weeks would be the proposed new fixed time frame. But within that process, we accept that there still will be, will be challenges uh, in terms of the EA seeking the required information from the various sources, including the schools and the health trusts. And that could be at any time in the year. Um, so the proposal in these um, current arrangements is that we would introduce an upper time limit at the various stages of the statutory assessment process. And that upper time limit would be a 34 week time limit. So regardless of the time of year and regardless of the exceptions that may be put in place, um, the upper time limit would apply and the EA would be required to make the decision on the statement within that time frame because at the minute we know that when a ballot exception is claimed that becomes an open-ended process and there's no requirement to close that off so the purpose of these changes is to try and address that particularly um, difficult situation and so that would apply right throughout the year summer and, and all the holiday periods Thank you, Ricky. Uh, we we know of all the work that's taken place to, to address the long time frames that we have had, um, and I suppose this committee will be keeping a, a very tight view on it going forward. Um, obviously, we we would like to see it done shorter, but um, we understand the complexities of it. Ricky, the Education Authority has been uh, well documented, or the issues has been well documented, and some of them have touched on there. But particularly in relation to operational administrative handling of the special education needs over the last number of years, um, can you comment on the readiness of the Education Authority in, the te in terms of applying the new regulations? You had updated and outlined there in relation to funding and training that has went out to schools, but it, this would be around actually the Education Authority themselves. Um, yes, Karen, it's a it's an excellent question. I mentioned during the opening statement that since 2017-18, the department has been funding the EA to prepare um, for implementation of the SEND Act. Um, and that preparation has included funding um, not just to support schools uh, and trusts, but also to support the EA itself. So the EA has, during the course of the last few years, been um, training all its staff in the new uh, SEN regulations and the code of practice. Um, it's also been working very closely with us through a number of specific governance structures. So we have had a steering group operating for a number of years now, which is jointly chaired by myself uh, and Mark Lee from the Department of Health. Members of the EA are on that steering group. Uh, and on a regular basis, we've been receiving reports in terms of the readiness and the preparation of the EA for the forthcoming um, changes. There's actually been quite a lot of work that has already been done uh, in anticipation of the new um, legislation coming into effect. So we had a project called the Notification Referral and Statutory Assessment Project, which is quite a long title, but essentially what it meant was we were trying to um, improve uh, our cooperation with the health trusts in relation to requesting advice from them for children who are going through the statementing process. 
So the EA um, have been working very closely with the trusts. We've introduced a number of standard templates requesting um, for requesting advice. The trusts themselves have actually put in place their own version of Senkos across each trust area. Um, and we've been exploring how we can introduce electronic sharing of information for requests to try and speed up um, the process. So there's been quite a lot of work um, done. There's further work that is required, Karen, um, uh, and we've been engaging very closely with the EA right throughout this process to make sure um, that they are ready for that. I did mention that we're hoping to commence one of the duties in relation to seeking the views of the child. We're hoping to do that um, very soon. Uh, again, the EA are ready and prepared for that, and we will continue to engage with them during the course of the next few weeks and months as we seek to bring forward the remaining um, duties in uh, the legislation. That's great, Ricky, and it's really positive. You've told us before around the, the particularly the trusts having their own senkos and, and all that work that's been done to streamline it so and improve the communication. So that's really good. Just finally for myself, I think I've seen in the, the, the document that there's an additional £30 million pound needed to support um, the implementation next year. Ricky, I was just wondering, has that already been secured? Has the bid been put in? Um, and... In relation to the £30 million then, uh, where will that be spent? Is it going out to individual schools or going directly to the Education Authority? Karen, thanks for that question. Um, so this year, £7.5 million was secured, um, and that is going to schools to cover the period January to March uh, 21, which is the last quarter of this financial year. That money will go directly to schools. Uh, and there is a formula um, for that. And as I said in the presentation at the start, the purpose of that money is to recognise that schools at the minute do not receive direct funding <clears throat> to support children who are on um, the code of practice stages from one to four. So this will allow the current SENCOs to start preparing for uh, the need to have uh, every child to have a personal learning plan on their SEN registers and to give them the time off timetable. In terms of going forward then into next financial year and beyond. Um, we have flagged a pressure of 30, millions, 30 million sorry, <laughs> per annum, which would be required to continue with that um, SEN framework implementation. Um, what I know at this stage is that the financial environment next year will be extremely challenging. Um, we haven't got any confirmation at this stage around the 30 million pound pressure but I will continue to flag that um, as a requirement to assist in the implementation um, of the new framework. Uh, and depending on the amount of money secured, we may have to adjust the phasing of the bringing in of some of the, some of the duties and the implementation of this. <coughs> but at this stage, the pressure has been flagged very clearly. Thank you, Ricky. That's me, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton, MLA. That is not there. Ooh. Apologies, Robin. <laughs> Daniel McCrossan, with us online. Daniel. Yeah, sorry, Thanks, Daniel. Daniel. Try again, Daniel. Me, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't sound particularly clear there. You might, might have to speak as loudly and clearly as possible. Is that any clearer? Slightly better, yeah. yes. Um, well, go, go, go ahead as loudly and clearly as you can. I, th I think we'll be able to make you out. Right. Um, well, first of all, Chair, I, I want to congratulate some serious uh, in Derry for their uh, considerable recognition this week and, and great award, good achievement for the school. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of happy faces, I'm sure, Karen and uh, my colleagues in the SDLP are delighted uh, with that as well. Uh, Ricky, thank you very much for your presentation and for the detail that is in it. Uh, I'll just jump straight to questions. Uh, much of the SEN changes being brought forward, while significant, are targeting administrative processes and the additional funding provided is targeted to meeting administrative needs. However, children uh, make best progress when they are taught effectively rather than about what are extra resources, 
uh, are you providing exclusively, exclusively for additional teaching time to enable schools to meet uh, the educational needs of their SEM children? Daniel, thanks. So I suppose it's a, it's a similar answer to Karen's question. So this year, <clears throat> schools will get 7.5 million across all sectors uh, to support um, them directly in supporting children who have SEN in a, anticipation of the new framework being rolled out. And we have flagged the 30 million pound pressure per annum going forward to continue with that uh, direct funding. And I suppose that comes from uh, our direct engagement with schools over the course of the last three or four years and Senkos directly. And we understand that Senkos struggle to get time off timetable to support children in their schools who very often need that support directly from the Senko. And the Senko also has to work very closely with the EA in terms of those children that need that additional support. So that's why this pressure has been flagged. That's why that additional money this year is going in. And I very much hope we can continue to provide that additional funding um, from uh, next year onwards. I appreciate the answer, Ricky, but I'm a bit of a skeptic here. Um, it's my view that the 7.5 million is to write plans. It's not actually to teach these children. So it's it's a combination, Daniel, and, th and this is where I, I look to colleagues to jump in because we know that some Senkos provide direct support to pupils who have SEN in their schools, and they also act in a coordination role. Um, Sharon, Jan, is there anything you want to add to that? We can't hear you, Sharon, sorry. Can I be heard now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, well the learning support coordinator in the future is called the center is a and school sam uh, operates within the school in terms of the provision that's put in place the writing of plans um, that you mentioned daniel um, will not be with the sole responsibility of the senco but these plans please don't underestimate the importance of them it's very important that each child has a personal learning plan. Their teachers will be involved. They will first of all be taking the Senko and one other out to train them in these. This uh, plan will relate to the provision that's to be put in place for the child SEN. And very importantly, for the first time ever, we'll look at what is working and what is not working. So we are targeting this area. But it doesn't just mean that the Senko or the LSC would be writing plans. They'd be directing others and helping others. Um, but the Senko role is laid out within the uh, the code as, a, as quite a varied role. Jan, I'll hand over to you to talk about the, the role of the LSC and Senko. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, LSC... Thank you, Sharon. I think there's an important point. Just sorry if I could come in. Okay. Teachers sure. have been writing these plans and teachers have known what is wrong or what is not wrong with the system to date. So why are we spending so much money identifying issues that we already know are issues? You're missing the point, Daniel. The, the, for the first time ever, we're going to have um, a plan which is specific for the child and relates to the provision that's being put in place and whether it's working or not. At a school level, they're going to be able to get information from that, which is management information, so that they can learn what is working or not. Key criticism from the Northern Ireland Audit Office is EA or ourselves, DE, do not know what special education as provision is effective. So it's very important that we have this documented yeah. and we're able to bring it up at a school level and at a system level. Sharon, I feel very strongly about this, as you'll imagine. Uh, but there was individual plans before. They were called IEPs. So this isn't, isn't entirely new. Well, IEPs, I've looked at IEPs because I've studied this in detail. So has Jan. And we worked with schools um, to look at uh, uh, the basis of the PLPs was actually what's in the IEPs. But they give more. They were co-designed with schools basically to concentrate on this 
special educational provision being put in place and whether it's working or not. Can I say an issue, a huge issue with the IEPs is they're an important thing regarding that child. They're a document. They sit in many and varied places. They're in many varied uh, forms. We as a department or the EA or even the school cannot draw out key information. That is good practice, can't be reinforced. We need to know for different types of SEN, for different types of children, different ages and different settings, what is working and what's not working. So I would say the IEPs might be good, but we're not getting any management information out of them for the schools and for the learning. I think a lot of teachers would probably disagree with that analysis, Sharon. But well, where are the IEPs in terms of the software? There is software. In the, in the you know, they're in schools and only in schools, Dan. But in the experience in the classroom, uh, like I, I know the teachers, after any plan uh, had taken place, sat there and then to evaluate the process, whether children have learned, whether they haven't learned, and then a new plan was drawn up as to what to do next. But we'll, we'll leave that point there. Just a, another question, uh, Sharon, but I appreciate your answer. Um, uh, Ricky, your, your quality and human rights policy screening for the draft SEN regulations and draft SEN code of practice decision was supported by a statement that declared the revised inclusion framework will improve the capacity of mainstream schools to meet the needs of the majority of children with special educational needs. A comprehensive training and awareness program has been developed to support school staff through the dissemination of effective SEN teaching and learning strategies and the continuous professional development program. Do you really have such a program to develop? And secondly, can you provide us with the details of the training and awareness program plus the continuous professional development program? Okay, Daniel, thanks for that. Um, again, I'll probably look to colleagues um, on this. There's been a training program happening for the last three to four years and actually continuing to happen now. Um, COVID has impacted on, on the um, delivery of that, but the EA has been funded to put in place an extensive program of training right across all schools, principals, senkos, uh, and other teachers. Um, there have been different elements of that, uh, focusing on different aspects of the new legislation. Um, and the training for the PLPs, which you've just talked about, um, is due to commence in January. Um, Sharon, do you want to add to that? No, um, that's right. Um, basically, we started off with the training program targeted the SEN and medical categories uh, register, which is more more than just a register, uh, talking about the different types of SEN and recording and so on. And building up from that, then there's been training um, going on on the code, the existing code. There's also SENCO induction training up and running at the moment, and that has been going on. COVID has, as Ricky says, impacted there. We also have the EA who have a SEND implementation team, um, an eight person team involved in that training. Um, and basically now they're working on, they're going through the SENCO induction at the moment. They're also doing, that's new SENCOs. And also then they're working on the code of practice. They'll move to the personal learning plan and the new code of practice next year. There's a whole program with this. Uh, and basically the idea and their uh, detailed, uh, there's detailed guidance and so on. So this is a big focus for us. We want to improve professional capacity of the SENCO and later the learning support coordinator. The key, it is a key post in uh, every school, which is why it's mentioned in primary legislation. Also important, Daniel, is that um, the uh, SENCO learning support coordinator New World identifies the training needs that are required for the um, uh, teaching staff and classroom assistants in the school. So that's that's also key in helping the improvement of SEN in the classroom and within the new SEN framework. So we have a budget line which is uh, each year, which is for SEN implementation. And that budget line is sitting at 2.541. K, which is 2.5 million, and that is really essentially focused on EA's work to get ready for the SEND implementation, but very importantly, to get the schools ready. And there's a million pounds of that, which is for sub cover for schools so that they can send the right people to the training and that they can do back work back in school. Mm -hmm. Okay, Daniel. 
Okay. Just a final very brief point, Chair. Very, very, very brief. Very brief. Thank uh, you. I'm interested in all this, the, this information. That those uh, parts of it sounds uh, quite uh, interesting and exciting, even, uh, if I could say it. But uh, many people watching and listening to this and who have taught uh, special education on these children for many years and have supported them and families as well uh, will be wondering why it has taken the Department of Education uh, 10 years to review the SEN framework. Why has it taken so long? Because I think we need an explanation of what extent are the significant problems that the Education Authority in respect to the SEN reporting caused a lack of policy certainty for the department? From the department. Um, Daniel, I, I think I think I got that question. You, you, you were breaking up a bit there. Um, so uh, this obviously came up during attendance at the Public Accounts Committee in terms of the length of time that it's taken um, to bring this forward. Uh, and the former Permanent Secretary was was very very clear um, on this point. So actually, the process of bringing forward a new policy. Um, began uh, probably around the time of 2009 when there was a consultation on what a new policy would look like. Um, and there was an extensive response rate to that. The executive agreed what that new policy would be in 2012. And then the work in the department began on bringing forward the draft bill that was required. So that was brought to the assembly in 2015 and that primary legislation was passed in 2016, and that's the SEND Act, NI 2016. So that happened in 2016. The department then consulted on the supporting regulations in 2017. Uh, but unfortunately, then the assembly and the executive collapsed for three years, so we couldn't complete that process. But in that time, we worked on refining the regulations and revising the code of practice. So, of course, when the executive came back earlier this year, that's allowed us to bring forward the draft code of practice and the draft regulations, and we began that consultation in September, as you know. So I accept it has taken a long time, but we are now at the point where we want to get this finished, get this done, and that's why we're here with you today to talk about those specific changes. Okay, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Robbie Butler, MLA. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robbie. Um, thanks, guys, uh, for me. It seems, it doesn't seem like the 11th of March was the last time that we met with Justice, to be fair, and, and a whole lot has happened. So, uh, and I want to thank you for the work that's going on. So, I will get straight to my questions, if that's okay. Um, guys, we have over 67,000 children with. Uh, SEN, um, that's across all educational sectors, includes statemented and non-statemented. Uh, I believe the statemented figure is over 19,000. I know that there's been some discussion in around the budget, but given the figures that we have, uh, are the budgets and the projected budgets realistic? Um, and on the budgetary question, um, what will be the reality for schools with regard to the provision for their children, particularly the statemented um, children? Um. Robbie, I suppose uh, that takes us into financial management territory. Um, and, and what I can say on that is that when it comes to supporting children who have special educational needs, it's very much a needs driven um, process. So um, the costs, of course, we know from previous years, we know that there's a total of 313 million per annum at this stage being spent right across SEN, and that's split across supporting special schools, uh, supporting <clears throat> children who are in mainstream um, with SEN and statements, SEN transport uh, and pupil support services for SEN through um, the EA. So um, the EA manages that process in terms of the operational aspects. And throughout the year, um, obviously, it would forecast the budget that it needs uh, to get through the rest of the year. And as appropriate, it would make um, bids to the department, um, which the department, <coughs> what I can see in the main, would meet um, as and when required. So that that's the process um, that will continue in terms of the budgeting and the forecasting going forward. Um, of course, in terms of the changes that we're trying to bring forward here, this is really about the policy and the legislative underpinning, which will allow 
the EA and support the EA to make the operational improvements that we know it's going through now. So we do still have a keen interest in knowing where the money will be spent. And I think one of the things that will help us going forward is what um, uh, Sharon and Janet have set out in terms of the role of the personal learning plans, because a key criticism from the audit office has been we do not have a strategic evaluation of the level of provision, and we cannot say whether that's value for money or not. So what we need to do and what we're doing is putting in place the measures that will allow us to evaluate that provision to tell us what works, what doesn't work, uh, and how much that costs, more importantly, getting right down to the level of child and the level of SEN, different categories of SEN and different types of provision. So that, I think, will inform our financial planning going forward, and that will also help the EA. I've, I don't know if I've mentioned, maybe I haven't, we want to work with the Education and Training Inspectorate in terms of a more strategic evaluation of SEN provision. Again, that was a recommendation from the Audit Office in their report. We have a, a first stage of that process was completed a couple of years back, but when inspection services resume, we want to do a much more detailed evaluation of SEN provision that's going to look at, again, those aspects of what's working and what's not working. And I think importantly as well, in terms of early intervention, what is the effectiveness of the early intervention measures that schools are putting in place to try and support children at the earliest possible stage to avoid the need to get to the point of a statement where it costs a lot more to deliver that need. So there are a number of critical pieces at play here, and they will all come um, into play during the course of the next few um, months as we go forward with this programme. No, no problem. I, I appreciate that. Um, um, I, just very quickly, and I suppose this is a yes or no answer. Do, um, genuinely, does the department have any fears or, or expectations that the by embedding the framework in the code of practice that there may be actually um, efficiency, synergies and savings that actually will keep it within the, the, the budget as it sits? Or is it, is it possible that the, the, this may honour uh, greater capacity, greater need for fiscal support? I suppose, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. honest, um, Robbie, on that. Uh, again, it's a needs-driven process. There are statutory duties here. The EA must deliver the provision that's required when it's identified in those children. I think what we need to look at is, are we identifying that need early enough? And when we provide that support, are we providing it in the most efficient and effective way? So whatever that costs then going forward will be whatever it costs, but I, I, I can't give you a definitive, unfortunately. No, at this fine, no, it's fine, isn't it? I don't want to waste my whole seven minutes on, on just the finance. I want to get into something I'm very passionate about. You mentioned about early intervention. Absolutely. I think it's it's absolutely key. But at the other side of early intervention, we've obviously got children um, and pupils who will be leaving school, whatever age and uh, that they, they, they leave at. So what focus uh, has the framework and code of practice got in regard to uh, improving outcomes for children with SEN, particularly in terms of lifelong, lifelong outcomes with regard to further and higher education and employment? Um, yes, oh, that's a good question again, um, Robbie. So actually, we do, we do know that um, attainment stats um, and educational outcomes for children with SEN have improved um, considerably. So in 2010-11, um, the percentage that were achieving five GCSEs, including maths and English, um, was around 24%. The latest figures I have uh, are now that that's closer to 41%. Um, percent. Um, likewise, in terms of uh, 2A levels, it was previously around 20% for children with SEN. It's now up to around 31%. Um, percent. So we've seen a significant improvement in attainment levels. Um, we also know in terms of the destinations um, for children whenever they leave school who have um, SEN, that there are higher numbers now who are attending higher educational um, institutions. So previously it would have been around 10%. It's now around 21%. Um, and we're seeing higher numbers going into further education as well. So previously 26%, um, and that's now around 43%. So we know that over, over the years, attainment levels have improved and more um, children with SEN are going into higher and further um, education and we also know um, that more there are a number of them going into employment um, and training as well and we want to see um, that continue but I think one of the things 
that there's a focus on now as part of this new framework uh, would be the transitioning. So the transitioning of pupils with the statement and that process starting at the age of 14, putting that plan in place with all the relevant um, partners who support that child uh, and then reviewing that transition plan. And we've, we're doing a piece of work at the minute with um, the Department uh, for the Economy and with health and with the EA around how we deliver that transition planning process for children with statements and how we monitor that going forward and how we can basically make sure that the outcomes for children when they leave school will be the best um, possible outcomes that we can achieve for them. Sharon, Jan, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, that's very comprehensive. We just had the first meeting, I think, of the project board for the transitions project. Um, so, you know, that because of COVID, that was delayed. Um, so that is a big focus now. And the SEND steering group are the overarching body that the project board will report to. So it's something you, you'll be interested in as time goes on, how that project is doing and the outcomes. And um, there is, transition is specifically covered in the code. I'll pass over to Jan now um, in terms of that. So you might want to have a look at what we've put in there. One of the things I want to say is to do with the special education provision, uh, disregarding a child um, having a statement uh, from a day-to-day -day perspective for any child in the school, the focus is always going to be on um, uh, improved outcomes. And the graduate and the new framework is providing for means looking at the special education provision that a child has been provided with, reviewing it to see is it working? If it's not, looking forward to then, what other provision do we have in place? One of the things in the code, which is very, very important, is that we're trying to get schools to focus on their special education provision. What provision do we have available to us? And adding to that, as, as EA supports come in, looking at the provision and saying, what else can we do that becomes a norm within the school for delivering for children with SEN? Um, with regard to the transition uh, planning uh, area, again, we have, through the regulations, um, refocused on the approach to transition planning. The school knows the child best, and um, along with the parent. And it's very important then that the school really takes the lead on transition planning for the child with the statement, um, involving clearly health and also careers in terms of really preparing that child for, for adulthood and um, driven by, and what we're trying to do here as well, is try to ensure there's consistency um, across the, 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 the EA insofar as clear advice coming from the, the EA to say, like, here's our directions, here's what we need you to look at with regard to the transition plan, and also then for the EA to approve those transition plans. So there's a clear mechanism and structure in place to, to, to make sure that those transition plans are meaningful and that there's a consistency of approach. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, could I just well, indulge here because uh, in, the, in the spirit of... Robbie, you're, you're well over your time, so if you'd be as brief as possible with a final question, please. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. I was just going to say I'm over my time because the, the, the answer was lengthy. Um, so, but, but, I appreciate, but I appreciate the answer, guys. Genuinely, really do because what you actually did was you answered my third question, Ricky, because I wanted to go into transition. Transition throughout life is one of those difficult and risky times. So thank you for that. Then this will be my final question, Chair, and I thank, thank you for that. No problem. Um, so we talked about the voice of the child. Um, yeah. And I just want, if you can even briefly outline exactly what that methodology will be and how that's going to be, because parents will be soon be consulted and, and, and the voices will be good. But and I know Nikki are fabulous uh, with the work that they do. Um, but I'm specifically interested in drilling down into the individual kids, especially given some of the difficulties that some of these children have, how that voice will genuinely be embedded uh, in, in the framework as we move forward. Well, okay, Robbie, I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand over to colleagues. So the EA will have a new duty, and that duty will be to listen to the voice of the child. And we have all the evidence and all the legislative and human rights frameworks that we need to tell us that this is the right thing um, to do. And stakeholders, again, are very positive on this. In terms of how it works, 
Um, maybe Sharon, you could give us a wee bit more detail about the process that you would see that coming into, probably in terms of statutory assessment. Well, there'll be different different stages. Statutory assessment is one. It's an EA duty, but also within the schools framework, and um, within the PLP, it also talks about uh, the views of the child and seeking the views of. So the views of a child throughout are very very important. How that would be done will uh, depend on the age of the child depend on the ability and the capacity of the child, but also every effort should be made. I'll give you an example. I was at a, a, in 2016, when we were doing the regulations consultation, I was at various youth groups. I was at one that was organized by a voluntary sector organization, and some of the children had very um, great problems in expressing themselves, but they had very good thoughts, and they wanted, but they had to be given the time and space and some assistance to express those thoughts, but they they had to be helped to do that. We would expect that, um, you know, looking at children in terms of them growing up and trying to facilitate them communicating and their views being made known. It is very, very important because in that 2016 consultation, I heard many views from children, but it did take time to actually give some of those views, it's very important that that time is, is given to getting those views. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Robbie. Okay. Uh, can I bring in uh, Robin Newton, MLA? Oh, sorry, Chair. Can I, I was having difficulty. I had to leave the room there to no get problem. my iPad uh, sorted out. Uh, so I've missed uh, most of, of, of what has happened. So maybe rather than questions uh, just make some comments chair if that's fine sure. uh, i i think I, I would pick up uh, really just uh, i think the importance of this is now very much on the agenda um and uh i, I think there are to, to quote uh, i think what was ricky said there are critical pieces of work uh, at play here and that's absolutely true and we need to uh, embed those critical pieces of work uh, into the policy and into the delivery. I think it's absolutely critical, given uh, what we have experienced uh, in, in the past, uh, the frustration of parents, the assessments and so on, critical that we do get this right. Uh, and I have to say, I do welcome the holistic, uh, the holistic interdepartmental approach. I think that's uh, very much a step in the right direction. Uh, and I, I, Sharon made the comments just uh, a few minutes ago about the importance of consulting with the child, uh, and that, that is right. Uh, I think uh, I would add to that, Sharon, the importance of uh, consultation with the parent uh, and consultation with the uh, school uh, principals and, and teachers and so on. Uh, but uh, I'm pleased sure, 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 with the discussion so far, and I think there is very much a, an emphasis being placed on, on addressing the issues that have been so pertinent <coughs> over this past, uh, well, since we came back after our three-year lapse. Of, uh, so I, 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 sorry I can't pick up on no more of what was said, but thank the, no. the, 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 the panel for, for, for this morning. Thank you, Robin. Hopefully those technical difficulties have been sorted for you there as well. Um, can I bring in William Humphrey? Uh, morning. Thank you very much, Greggy, Sharon and Jan. Uh, good to see you, Jan. You're a very tasteful Christmas display on your mantle. That looks well. Putting it all, putting it all the shame. Um, in terms of the, the consultation, um, can I just ask, um, has, has there been uh, sufficient uh, consultation, do you think, with the special educational needs principles around this issue? Um, yeah, um, good question again. Uh, we've had various aspects of this consultation that's been a very much a targeted um, consultation, um, William. So um, at various points, kind of throughout the last three to four years, the team have been engaging with um, the likes of SENCOs um, and principals specifically on what the new SEN framework um, would look like. So I would say there has been um, pretty much extensive consultation and that would have included principals from the special um, needs schools and particularly around the co-design of some of the aspects 
of the code of practice, like the personal learning plan templates and so on, because we know that we can't do this without making sure that we've engaged with the people who are going to be delivering this on, on the ground. Um, now, during the formal consultation process, which started at the end of September, there then have been additional targeted consultations that have been um, put in place. So it's it's been a fairly lengthy um, process, but the the response so far has been very positive. You talked about this then implementation team. Yep. Uh, as part of your presentation, uh, can I ask um, who are they and how was that team appointed? So that's a team that is embedded within the EA Children and Young People Services Directorate. Um, the department has been providing funding since 2017-18 um, for that team. So it's an operational decision in terms of who the EA appointed into that team. Um, but it has been an operation for a number of years um, and it will probably continue into next year. That team has been critical in all of this for us because they're really the connection with um, the schools and the staff within EA in terms of preparation and readiness for these changes coming down the track um, next year. So it's an EA-led um, operational team, William. So can everyone is needed by EA. Just, uh, oh. No, it's a seconded mixture of some EA staff and also seconded teachers because it's thought that they are the best people to actually do the main training. So there's quite a body of them. There's, a, I think there's about six of them who are seconded mm -hmm. singles. Okay. Uh, some some mm -hmm. staff do operations and uh, some singles as well. And to be honest, it's been invaluable to, to certainly me having worked in this mm -hmm. for like a hundred years. Um, and, uh, they have been excellent, very professional, and um, I, I couldn't commend them enough. Okay. In terms of the statementing and the, the reduction down to 22 weeks uh, that it was mentioned earlier, um, the end of the day, 22 weeks um, is still five and a half months you know, which is huge pressure on that child, on his or her family, on the, on the teacher, the principal, and all the other children in the classroom. And further to the audit office report and the PAC inquiry, which continues, I mean, is there sufficiency? I mean, it's good to hear about the, 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 the work with the EA and um, the department working closely together around this. But as we know from the inquiry and from evidence that's been given, a lot of the time, a lot of the reasons for the delay is cited as being health. So um, has there been uh, sufficiency in terms of the joined upness with the Department of Health and the trusts around this to try and drive this, this figure down and get the information through quicker if that is cited as it is as the major or one of the major problems in children being statemented? Um, yes, I suppose there's two aspects to that um, question. The first is just around that 22-week period, um, which is currently 26 um, weeks. And, you know, and, we, and we've looked across the jurisdictions here in terms of where uh, this would put us. Uh, and it would actually put us um, um, ahead of Scotland and Wales in terms of um, the time frame, which are 24 and 26 weeks, but just to caution that it's very difficult to make those comparisons because the systems are are very different there. The processes involved in statutory assessment and statementing are complicated and have many steps. Um, and that is, that is the reason why it is as long uh, as it is. Within that, um, if health advice is required and if health do need to see that child then that in itself is a challenge that we know. Um, so for the last number of years, we have been working very closely with um, the Public Health Agency, the Health and Social Care Board, and the Department of Health senior officials uh, in terms of how we make sure that that process will work um, smoothly. So um, compliance rates from the Department of Health um, during the last few months, months in terms of them providing their advice have been around, I think, 77%. Um, and I mean within the time frame that they are allotted to do that. 
So obviously we want to try and build on that as we go into this new this new SEND framework, but we understand there will be challenges that the health service will will face. And there may be circumstances, um, William, where health will say that they haven't been able to see a child because an appointment hasn't been kept or um, for whatever reason, they just haven't been able to do the assessment. And that is built into the code of practice where health would then come back to EA and notify them that they require uh, a wee bit extra time in order to provide to do their assessment and provide their advice. And I suppose that's one of the drivers for us seeking to introduce the upper time limits. So the upper time limits of 34 weeks, and that means that the EA would still have to make um, its decisions around the statement, if one is required within that time frame, um, regardless of whether um, the full information is there or not. But of course, we want to continue to work with health as much as we can to support that process. And I think I mentioned earlier, there have already been a number of significant improvements made. So trusts have appointed their own version of SENCOs across each trust. We've looked at standardizing the advice templates across each trust to make sure that everyone is aware. The trusts have been training their staff um, on this process, and we've looked at electronic data sharing as well to speed that up. So I think we've done everything we can, and we'll continue to work with them over the course of the next few weeks and months. No, that's a very William, positive sorry, answer. Just, but... William, sorry to cut across you briefly. Ricky, I might have to put an upper limit on your uh, answers here, if that's OK. I'll hand back to, to William. Thanks, William. Um, thanks. The, you know, that, that's encouraging to hear that, but what I was going to say, and it's good to hear that the trusts have appointed their own SENCOs and that they, the working across government is better. Was, was there thought given to go in that further step then in terms of, when you talk about the implementation team or a steering group, for actually one of those SENCOs uh, or a rep from the health department or the public health authority to sit on that or either of those bodies? Oh, so the steering group is representative of those organisations. So um, I, would, I would co chair it, and we do have, we have representation from the trusts, um, from the EA, from a number of different departments, including health. Uh, and um, you know, we do have those conversations on a regular basis, and there's a lot of engagement that goes, goes on in between meetings. So we do have that level of representation. Mm. I just, I'll just finish with this. And it's not for me to tell you how to do your job, but in terms of getting you know, better joined upness. So perhaps someone or one of those Senkos sitting on the implementation team might be might be a thought. Thanks, Chair. Yep. Thanks, for okay, well, Thanks, William. Thanks. Can I bring in uh, Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Ricky, Sharon, and Jan for coming and giving those um, presentations and answers to those questions. Um, Robbie has actually already um, asked the question mm -hmm. about the voice of young people or the child in relation to this. I would just like to ask Ricky again: Would you see the role of the youth sector be included in this action? Um, so, yeah, I'm going to hand over to colleagues on that one to see if they can help me out with that. <laughs> um, well, if it's regarding, it's, it's an, a duty on EA, Nicola, um, so in terms of, say, the statutory assessment, I wouldn't see the youth sector as being involved with that because it would be up to EA to glean the views of the child and indeed the views of the parents. And in fact, that's in, in, in the statutes, uh, that's in the regulations that they have to do that. So to answer that one, uh, no, but I'm sure the youth sector are involved. Um, for example, they're, they're, they're involved, would you believe it, in taking forward um, the targeted consultation for us yeah, on yeah. the regulations and the code of practice. They're doing that for us now. Um, that would be online. Um, so, you know, in terms of us wanting feedback we're using the EA youth service they're helping uh, get, glean those views so in that way they're very much involved but in terms of that particular process for um you know uh, assessing a child it would probably be true to say no not in that process that's great thank you um, i'd just like to say um i appreciated your um kind of focus on um incorporating the child's view within this decision making so thank you mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicola. Justin McNulty. 
Thank you, Chair. And can I begin with welcoming you on board, our newest member of the committee, um, Ms. Brogan. So you're very welcome and best of luck in your in your role going forward. Um, thank you, Ricky, uh, Sharon, and John, for your presentation this morning. Uh, very important evidence, and um, I think the overarching ethos of listening to the voice of the child is a fantastic ethos, and I think it's something, something that must be embedded into everything, all the work that uh, happens going forward. Um, and in that, Senko, who came up with the term Senko? Was that taken out of 1984? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just obviously it's a shortening <laughs> of um, saying coordinator, but I, I don't know who, who coined that one first, Justin. That first it's... appeared in the Code of Practice in 1998. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's where Senko came, uh, but it wasn't a statutory responsibility no. to have a Senko. Uh, it was only then with the SEND Act that every school had to have a uh, person for coordinating uh, the special education provision in the school, and that's where our learning support coordinator came into the picture. Well, here, the, the person, the person is fantastic and really <laughs> important is the naming, is the, is the labelling, and I think for a young mm -hmm. child hearing that term, uh, that would frighten me, you know, your sound code's coming, or your sound code's going to happen, get, get, can you get rid of that term? I think it's terrible. Oh, we are, we are getting rid of it. We are getting rid of it, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. good. That's in the law, and the new SEND Act. Yeah. What's the new term? Learning support coordinator. Learning support coordinator. Learning support coordinator, yeah. Okay, that's much uh, softer. It's not snappy. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. That's good to hear. Um, in terms of, Ricky, you mentioned that the assembly collapsed for three years and that it impacted the timelines around the vision of the new SEND framework. Can you tell me, Ricky, how many children and families have been failed because of the standoff for three years? I, I couldn't. I couldn't answer that, um, Justin. All I can say is that the department during that period continued to work on these regulations and this code of practice. So we made good use of that time um, to make sure that we were as prepared as possible for this current um, consultation. And we actually did make a number of significant um, refinements, including bringing bringing in the time frame around 22 weeks. So. Um, in terms of the broader question, that, that would be um, beyond my capacity to answer, unfortunately. Well, I just to put myself in the position of a parent or family whose children have been let down because of that standoff. And I'd be a very, very angry parent knowing that a standoff between political parties has held back my child. I'd be very, very angry. Um, how many, um, sorry, given that in 2017, the audit office found that 79% of new SEND statements took longer than the 26th uh, week statutory limits, how confident are you that a 22 statutory limit is achievable? Given that, that there are challenges in EA also, that there's, they're, they're going through a, a period of transition and, and culture change, how confident are you, are you that it's achievable and is it ambitious enough? Hey, there's no doubt it's a big challenge, Justin. I mean, that figure of 79% in the 2017 Audit Office report. Uh, in the 2020 follow-up impact report, um, that figure was 85%, uh, which were outside the 26 weeks. Now, I know the EA has been to this committee and has set out its improvement plan. Uh, and I can tell you that over the course of the last few months, we've seen a significant improvement in that level of performance. Um, so for the month of October, the latest figures, which I have, um, we know that actually 42% were completed within 26 weeks, and that is uh, a, a significant improvement. We also know that there are much fewer statements waiting beyond that 26 week period. So the EA has put a massive focus on this and has reconfigured its services to address all the shortcomings that um, have been well um, publicized. Look, it will still remain a massive challenge to do this within 22 weeks, um, but we've been working with the EA as much as we can to support them on that. Um, funding has been provided and they've been involved in this process um, right throughout. So. We will just have to um, monitor that once that new um, provision comes into place, if that's what's decided after the consultation. Okay, thank you, Ricky. 
Um, in terms of the consultation process, what has been the level of engagement? I know it closes in a few weeks. Are there any relevant stakeholders who haven't been involved at a level that maybe we've done something? Is there a parents group uh, uh, representing the parents that have been engaged with yeah. as part of this? Do you, want me to answer? Do you want me to answer that, Ricky? Yes, yeah, Sharon. Um, so we're doing targeted consultation. I've mentioned about uh, youth service and EA are helping uh, the children and young people. Um, we also have hired an organisation, which we did the same time, uh, <laughs> same time around the regulations. But this time, um, we're focusing on uh, parents and views on particular aspects of the regulations and the code of practice. So we're interested in their views. So we've singled out a particular areas. We've given a lot of support uh, to the organisation that's doing this, and that's underway at the moment. So yes, it's very important that we hear parents' views. In 2016, we heard parents' views very clearly. Two things that we're worried about was about the uncertainty around annual review and not hearing uh, the result of those meetings that happen in school concerning their child's statement, maybe not hearing for nine months. We've addressed that in the regulations, bringing that forward and making sure that that's more timely. The second thing that we heard from parents in 2016 was that we've got it wrong in terms of remediation timescales that were far too challenging for them. Now we've went sort of the opposite way, and we've given them um, what you know a wider time frame for those timescales. So we're interested, have we given them too much time? You know, what's their view? So we, we want to hear back, yes, and we will act on that. Excellent. In, in addition, Justin, what we've spoken to, uh, we've met with uh, the Children's Commissioner, uh, we've met with the Equality Commission, uh, Children with Disabilities Strategic Alliance, um, Children's Law Centre, and uh, so we're, we're going to the statutory organisations and others uh, to have direct uh, discussion during the consultation in terms yeah. of any yeah. issues that they have. Thanks, John. Excellent. Uh, listen, I wish you wish you well. Just one, one final quick question. In, ter in terms of that statutory consultation, and in terms of the engagement with stakeholders, um, the Middletown Centre for Autism and such facilities, how do they fit into the consultation process? How are they engaged with and how will they fit into the new framework and models as you see it? Well, I suppose, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go quickly on that one, I'm conscious of time. Um, Middletown is um, one of the department's arm's length um, bodies and provides an invaluable service in terms of supporting children um, with ASD and their families. So we engage with them right throughout the year. The department um, funds them. Um, they work very closely with the EA on delivery um, of services as well. So um, yes, we of course um, they have been a part of this um, development process for for a number of years and will be a key service provider in meeting the needs of children with CN and particularly ASD. Justin, going forward. Okay, thank you. Listen, Ricky, Sharon, John, best of luck with your important work going forward. Thank you very much for your evidence today. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Okay, Ricky, um, I, I could ask a wide range of questions. I'll try to stick to time as best as I can. Um, I do have a number of questions, though, so we'd be grateful for concise answers. And if you can't answer the question that's grand, just say so. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking them um, for any other reason other than to get information. So if you have to provide it alternatively, that's fine. Um, what, how and to what extent have... Senco's being consulted in relation to this process. I'm going to hand over to Sharon for that one. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Jan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, um, we have uh, engaged um, quite significantly with um, Senco and through Senco cluster groups, which are an excellent uh, way of, of communicating through the Senco's, both in terms of the very important school section in terms of the school approaches uh, to whether there's a concern whether a child has um, and also the, the three stages of special education provision. Uh, we had lots of workshops um, across the province. Also with regard, importantly, with regard to the personal learning plan, um, really that was a co-production because um, this needs to work for the schools. The PLP needs to work for the schools. Okay. So, Essentially, that was a building process okay. uh, in talking. So, 
Okay. Yes, lots of engagement. Thanks, John. And what, what feedback did you receive from the, the Senco cluster groups? Well, it, it was an evolving process because um, we took we took the PLP, for example, out and we said, right, does this work? Uh, is there anything else need to be included in it? Um, and so the feedback was an ongoing uh, process. And actually then the PLP that we're consulting about is actually the net result of that. So okay. that was good, the feedback. Okay, thanks. And why is the personal learning plan a six page document when the individual education plan was a one page document? Well, look, I mean, I'll, I'll start and then I'll have to hand over, unfortunately, yeah. Chris, and that one again. But um, I think uh, the importance of the PLPs here um, cannot be overstated because for the first time, it will standardize the system right across the schools. Um, it will be held digitally on the same system. We will be able to generate reports around the um, effectiveness of different types of provision for different SAN categories. So reflecting all of that, the PLP needed to be able to capture that relevant um, information. Jan or Sharon? I, th I think it's, um, it's misleading to look at the word document mm -hmm. and think that it's six pages because this is in software. So for various of the ones of those headings, they'll have drop down menus and they will select those and not be completing them in sort of longhand typing. So once these are set up, you know, life will become much easier in terms of completing the PLP. So, you know, the flatness of a Word document in terms of the consultation is giving a false impression because this is in software. Okay. I think one of the other things is also that the PLP will be from the evidence base uh, whenever a school is going to the EA for stage two services and yeah. also then a reduction. So that, that means a reduction in paperwork, similar to um, it'll be used for statutory assessment. So the aim of the PLP is actually to reduce that bureaucracy and paperwork. It's multi-purpose. It has, yes. Yep. Okay. And how, how will you ensure that SENCOs or learning support coordinators will have adequate time to uh, allocate to the personal learning plan? So I suppose that's where the um, the seven and a half million this year and the pressure that's been highlighted going forward comes into play, um, Chair, because um, that funding going directly to schools is designed to allow Senkos to have that time and space to do their full job. And, and you're confident that that additional funding will give them the adequate time and space to complete their full job? Well, that's what we'll have to see when we get in, into that um, process. So we'll, we'll get some feedback from the funding that goes out this year uh, and, and we'll, look, we'll look at that and see how well that um, has worked for us. Okay. Um, the, the feedback that I've received, uh, um, I'll get on to the statutory assessment uh, stage um, quickly here, but the feedback that I receive is that delays in support prior to commencement of this of a statutory assessment um, for special educational needs is as um, difficult uh, and, and limiting as the delays with the, the statutory assessment uh, stage of the assessment are so um, how, how will you address time delays in support prior to commencement of sta statutory assessment in terms of special educational needs support I think, Chair, that's probably straying into the operational side of things and the, the work that the EA is currently going through in terms of its improvement plan. I okay. mean, that would relate that would yeah that would relate to the current stage three or, or in the new system the current um, stage two. So I think that's that's an operational issue for the EA to improve access to its pupil support services and also. Um, educational psychologist. Okay, and how, well, how, how will the Department of Education help increase educational psychology capacity? So this year uh, we have funded um, additional training capacity through the educational psychologist course at Queen's. So we have increased that to 10 um, being funded this year and 10 uh, for the intake um, next year. So. Um, there's that, and we also know that the EA itself 
um, has brought additional educational psychologist capacity in this year uh, and I know as well that they're going through a capacity and demand exercise to identify um, the, the level of need that they have within their service okay. to we'll meet we'll the needs that. out there. We'll watch that carefully then. Okay, in terms yep. of the new SEN regulations and framework, you've said that your, the aim of the department is to end statutory assessments taking longer than they should. Has the department set a target date to achieve this aim? Uh, well, I suppose uh, everything that we've talked about today and everything that's in the consultation will be subject to further analysis after the consultation and then we need to bring all this forward to the assembly for affirmative um, resolution. So in terms of commencement chair, um, that will be a phase process. So uh, and different aspects will be commenced at different times. So once we commence different ver aspects of, of the framework, then of course we will be monitoring very closely. Um, how those are, those are delivered? Okay, that sounds like a no. Um, how many how many children are currently waiting longer than the current statutory time limit of twenty six weeks for an assessment of special educational need? So the latest figures I have would be at the end of October, and that's three hundred and fifty two. Only 352 children are waiting longer than 26 weeks for an assessment of special educational need? That's correct. This time last year, that would have been 1,070. Okay. Some so progress, the, the, some significant progress, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The EA has put a massive focus on this in the last few months, um, and we receive regular updates across various performance metrics. I say, I say only in relation to what it previously was. It's obviously still unacceptable, and you said that that's uh, fifty-eight percent um, of children um, are waiting longer than twenty-six weeks, which is obviously um, more than uh, one in two children waiting longer than six months for an assessment of their special education needs. What what is the the longest? Um, I, that, I don't have that figure with me, Chair. That's I would need to get that from um, from the EA. Okay, that uh, that would be helpful. How, yeah. how how many of of those waiting longer than twenty six weeks is due to a valid exception? Again, Chair, sorry, I wouldn't have that information. Okay, you can get that for us though. Then, yeah. I can ask the EA, uh, yes. Okay, and, and as some of my colleagues have said this morning, valid exception includes delay and health trust advice. Is, is there a current upper limit for health trust advice being provided? Um, Sharon, can you talk Yes, to that one? Um, there is. There's a six-week limit in the 2005 regulations, but the weakness of those regulations is there's no uptime limit. So once an exception is claimed, and that's what we've tried to do in the new regulations, shifting to those is to close yeah. that off, allowing it for other six weeks. Okay, so sorry, so I'm, not, I'm not, not sure I heard you uh, entirely there. So the the upper limit of six weeks is foregone so the, if it's a valid exception. Yeah. Say right. that again. So what? So there's an upper limit of six weeks for health trust to provide advice, correct? There is a limit. There's no such thing as an upper limit in terms of uh, the 2005 regulations. In other words, there's a six-week time limit for health to provide their advices. Once they claim a valid exception, then there is no upper time limit. We've sought in the new regulations to close that off. Okay, so currently there's no time limit on a, on a valid upper exception? Upper time limit. Okay. Yeah, yeah but that's right. The new regulations even if there is a valid exception, will still require that advice to be provided within six weeks? Six weeks is the first period of time. Then the second period of time, which is the upper time limit, is a further six weeks. So if an okay. exception is claimed, it will be 12 weeks. Okay. And do you know how many statements um, that are currently beyond 26 weeks are due to a delay in health trust advice? Uh, no, Chair, I, I would need to ask the EA. Okay. And 
what, what is the nature of the health trust advice required in an assessment of special educational need and, and why does this part of the process um, consistently seem to take longer than the identified weeks to complete? So there are four aspects, community paediatricians um, along with allied health professionals who are the occupational therapists speech and language therapists and physiotherapists. So between those four areas, potentially they all may need to provide advice depending on the circumstances of, of each child. So it, are there inadequate resources in, in those um, areas to meet the, the, the statutory limits then? That's probably a question for the health um, well, have authorities, you asked it? Chair. Have you asked it? Well, of course, we meet with uh, our health colleagues on a regular basis, uh, and I think I said um, earlier that the compliance rates, even during the um, previous periods of um, the pandemic, have actually been very high in terms of providing their advice during the six weeks period. So we are constantly um, monitoring and working with health to make sure that they are prepared for um, these changes coming down the track. Not trying to be difficult here, but you said you didn't know how many of the delayed statements were due to health, valid exceptions from Health Trust, and you've just told me that compliance yeah. is high. So which one is it? Yeah, yeah, no, no, those 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 statements are both correct. Um, of course, we monitored health compliance during the pandemic, um, but I don't have the detailed breakdown of okay. the current number, which I have, 352 of many of those would be related to health delays. I don't have that information with me, okay. unfortunately. I suppose the concern, and, and other and colleagues have mentioned budgets, um, the, the new regulations and code of practice um, can introduce new time limits and new de deadlines, but if the resources aren't in place, are they going to address the the abject failure to assess and respond to special educational needs of children in a timely way? So I suppose this is similar to a question earlier on where I've said this is a needs driven um, process in terms of meeting um, needs which are assessed and that's an operational issue for the EA. It's currently 313 million that's provided for children with SAM um, and the EA makes bids in year if um, it forecasts that it um, will have additional needs to be met. So then we've also provided funding to prepare for this new framework directly to the EA and, and separate to that level of funding. So that, of course, will continue as we go forward. So you assess that the EA has, a, has adequate funding and that it's up to them to operationalize that funding effectively? So, look, what we know, Chair, is that the numbers of children with SEN is, is, of course, increasing every year. And it's back to my point about we need to have a strategic evaluation, as has been pointed out by the Audit Office um, and the PAC. We need to understand what levels of provision work, what is effective, what is not, um, and how best to provide it, and when, and uh, if we can provide that uh, as early as possible. So all okay. of those things all, yeah. all come together. Yep. Okay. okay. And, and given given the level of, of systemic failure, will uh, will achieving that aim not require an independent review of DE and EA SEM provision? So there wouldn't be any plans at this stage, Chair, given the amount of information and what we know from the various um, reports from the Audit Office. There's a report due from the Public Accounts Committee um, the Children's Commissioner has provided a report. The EA has done its own internal audit of practice and there's an improvement plan in place. The department has delivered a transformation project around um, SEN learner journey. So there are uh, an extensive range of recommendations that need to, to be implemented and the EA has established a strategic programme to bring forward all those um, delivery improvements in a coherent Okay. Uh, manner and, and okay. in co-design with key stakeholders, Chair. A okay. couple of short last questions from me, Ricky. Um, do you, are the teacher unions in support of the new regulations and code? We've engaged with both the um, the teaching unions and the non-teaching um, unions, uh, and I would say the short answer to that is yes. Okay. Sharon. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and. You, I was going to ask you for a time scale for the commencement of the regulations, code of practice, indeed all provisions of the SEND Act. 
is that possible to provide? It will be phased, Chair, probably during the course of um, next year and possibly beyond. Um, obviously, I can't predict the outcome of the consultation. And then, of course, we need to come back to the committee uh, and then we need to bring it to the Assembly. So um, it will be a phased timetable and we'll talk to you in more detail about that once we know it. I, I imagine the committee would appreciate more detail than a phased time scale over the next year and beyond, if that's possible. Well, I would say we'll be, start, we'll be starting in September 21 with some of the commencements, but working with the committee on how the regulations go through. Okay. You know, when yeah. the regulations go through, we'll be able to start commencements. Okay. Yeah. And look, it's not entirely related, but um, pertinent and serious in, in my mind. Can, can I ask why the, the school restart engage program funding doesn't apply to special schools? Um, so I think I answered this a couple of weeks ago and said that there is a bespoke program for special schools, which is currently being co-designed with special school principals. You will appreciate that we're, we're now looking at end of the new year um, in terms of the academic year. And if it's school restart funding, how, how is that not grossly out of date? So we're just we're continuing to work with those principals on the the aspects of that program, Chair. So okay. that's really all. Thanks. Thank, thanks for that, Ricky. Um, we are just about within time, so I can take two very very brief um, final supplementaries from Daniel McCrossan and then Justin McNulty. Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, you let me in. Uh, first of all, I am delighted to hear that forty two percent of the statements uh, are processed, are processed uh, within the twenty six week period. But I'm just wondering, does that include valid exceptions? And if it doesn't include valid exceptions, what would the actual percentage be? It does, as far as I'm aware, Daniel, but I'd like to confirm that with the EA and come back to you. Well I know that it doesn't, Ricky, and the reality is that because it doesn't, it paints a very stark picture and a much more worrying reality. Uh, and you know, it gives me considerable concern from what I've just received in a text message from uh, people in the sector. Uh, and I'm told also that there hasn't been level of engagement with Senko's, uh, as has been illustrated in this presentation. That's, turn, that's not right. No, we, we have engaged with Senko's. Yeah. We have. No, no. I know that you've engaged, but the level that is articulated in this uh, presentation, uh, you know, would suggest that he's did so extensively. But the information I've received, in fact, in two text messages, would suggest that there hasn't been extensive engagement in form. From one Senko, is that? Because we have involved Senko's, we just can't involve all Senko's. Yeah. Well, the, I can assure you that this particular person is very well chosen and. Um, is very well informed and it gives well we're we're presenting to you what we believe to be the truth and we have been involved with uh, single cluster groups okay. well, do you know the answer to the question I took in ricky in relation to the valid exceptions and what the actual percentage would be should they be included because they're not included at the moment Daniel, I have to check that with, yeah. with the EA but my understanding was that the current performance figure is 42 percent uh, completed within 26 weeks and not included valid ex exceptions, but I, I will check that and come back. Okay. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, thanks, thanks, Daniel. Justin McNulty? Yeah, as well. Justin? Trying to unmute myself here. Can you, you hear me there, guys? Go ahead. Yeah, very quickly, uh, we've spoken a lot about the time frame for the statementing process. What about the time frame for the implementation of the supports after the statementing process has been completed. What are the, the, what's the data around that in terms of historically and what are the targets? I think that's, um, Daniel, a valid question, but that's, an, that's operational performance data for the EA in terms of all the various SAN services that, that it has uh, and the individual needs of children. So I wouldn't have that information today. It's, it's important oh. information. Yes, no, obviously there are, there's literacy services, early um, 
early year services, autism advisory services. Um, there are many, many services that are put in place uh, and that operational data in terms of when that support is provided would, would, would be for the EA to manage. So I, I don't have that with me. Okay. Okay. Can we get can we get that data provided to us at the earliest opportunity, please, Ricky? Either through yourselves or EA. We we can make that request. Yes. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, Ricky, Sharon, and John, thank you very much indeed for your your presentation uh, today. Um, I think the extent of the questions is ongoing evidence of the commitment that the committee has to see an improvement in this uh, particular area of provision for children with special educational needs. So thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for the work that you're um, doing on this. And obviously, we'll um, remain uh, in close attention to uh, progress on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. OK, Clark, uh, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all witnesses and add all members back into the spotlight and ask uh, the clerk to summarise any actions or requests for additional information resulting from the briefing. So, Chairperson, um, while I wait for broadcasting to put all the members back in, so I'll have a go at summarising here, and this is where members jump in and keep me right. So, I think perhaps the committee wants to write to the department seeking sight of the training and awareness programme and the personal um, development uh, programme which is in support of um, the new SEND regulations, um, some of which come into effect from 18th of December and other measures like the um, five stages becoming three come in from the, uh, the March uh, 2021. Um, also then uh, perhaps the committee would like to seek sight of the ETI SEND evaluation mm -hmm. timescales in terms of reference. Um, additionally, then, um, if, uh, coming back on uh, Robbie Butler's uh, question, uh, if we can seek um, information on the transition planning process, because they said they were doing work on that to assist uh, SEND children with their transition. And further to that, um, there isn't actually any information on the, uh, the usual NISRA um, uh, paper uh, on SEN children's qualifications and destinations. So we could perhaps ask what they can tell about that. So briefly, members, what happened was in the last year or so, SEN categorizations were changed. So the number of children with SEN dropped by about, um, I don't know, I think it was about 11,000. Um, because what had happened was schools had recorded children who had medical problems um, as having SEN, which they didn't necessarily have. Um, that made the numbers change, but it might also change the qualifications and destinations quite a lot, because you might have been, um, uh, if you like, sort of over-reporting. A child has um, heart condition, say, um, then ends up going to university. Um, they might have been previously recorded as a SEN child when they were not. So if you have the correct numbers now, that might give you a different picture on SEND qualifications and destination. Um, additionally then, uh, members, um, if you like, we could ask the uh, department to give us the contact details for their SEND cluster. I'm just thinking that when I stop being the clerk in the new year, and this all comes to into being, what the committee might want to do is to have a stakeholder event, maybe when the building's open again, and invite the SEN cluster members to come up and tell us what they think about what you, what they think to you about uh, the new SEN arrangements. SEN co clusters, yeah. SEN co clusters, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Thank no your problem. pardon, yeah. Chairperson. Thank yeah. you. Um, additionally, then, uh, we're looking for further information on um, the uh, SEN statements, um, those that are uh, waiting for 26 weeks, how many are waiting for health trust advice, and for the breakdown on that. Um, further, members, um, one of the officials there mentioned that the department funds educational psychology courses, um, presumably at Queen's, I don't know that, but um, I didn't know they did that. Um, so maybe we get some more information on how long they've been doing that, what they actually uh, fund. They also referred to uh, an EA review of that service, so perhaps write to the EA and ask them about that. Additionally then, um, one of the officials referred to the DE transformation uh, the, on the SEND learner journey. I thought that had all been paused and I didn't know that it was being restarted. So if that's happening, then perhaps the committee might want to know. And then additionally, um, details of the time scale for the uh, commencement and for the uh, bringing forward the regulations. So to be clear, the commencement 
All that happens is they'll write to the committee as they have done in tabled items today and they'll just tell you there's nothing for the committee to do. The regulations, that's a different matter. Um, those will come to the floor of the Assembly, uh, probably if their um, draft affirmative as has been indicated, so there'll be a debate then. Um, so time scales on that. And then finally come on, on uh, Mr McNulty's question, just asking I think to the EA about the time scales for the delivery of supports post the issuing of statements. Sorry, members, that was a lot. Have I missed anything? Uh, that's a fairly comprehensive summary. Robin Newton, yep. No, okay, just add to, to it, uh, Peter. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe it's just something I, ha I have missed, but when uh, Ricky Irwin was referring to the work of the interdepartmental group, um, do we know what the reference terms, terms of reference are for that group or when that group will report? I think that's actually, uh, maybe we hope we're not across purposes here, but if you look at page 142, right. this was uh, of your PACs, yeah, this was something we heard about um, previously. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same thing. Um, so... Um, this one refers to, 142 refers to the health and education. Right, a bigger I think he, he, he mentioned, uh, I thought he mentioned four departments are working together. Okay then, right, we'll ask him about that. Thanks, Chairperson, thanks for the member for clarifying. Okay. Any other members, any additional matters to raise on that? No? Clark, can I... Uh, can I uh, take the, the lead of colleagues in, in maybe proposing uh, that we write to St Cecilia's okay. um, Derry to echo uh, congratulations on the School of the Year Award? Uh, I, I was glad to meet with pupils and staff of St Cecilia's with uh, some members, including Karen Mullen and Daniel McCrossan, recently in relation to um, serious concerns about curriculum and examinations this year um, that are obviously increasingly shared by many people across Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and I found the, the pupils extremely impressive and coherent in articulating their concerns. So um, no, no shock to, to see them receive that award thereafter. Um, and perhaps we could also re extend that um, written congratulations to Hazelwood Integrated College as well on their nomination for this award category, which obviously shows um, the excellent work of schools across Northern Ireland. Yeah, I, I echo that. Um, yep. Three excellent schools. Um, we've done us very proud. and. Obviously, I'm very biased. to see this being my my school, um, uh, and like Chris said, great school, massive achievement. So we're absolutely delighted for them. Agreed. Okay, members, content to agree all those actions. Agreed. 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 Thank you. Okay, members, we move to agenda item six, uh, which is our briefing from the Department of Education, Education Authority and Department of Health on the looked after children and care experienced children and young people's strategy. Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 194, a copy of the draft looked after children and care experienced children and young people's strategy, plus relevant correspondence from the ministers for health and education at page 201, other relevant information, including assembly research paper, and a relevant extra extract from the previous strategy, Care Matters, from page 265. Can I welcome back Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education, Angela Cain, Head of Pupil Support Team at the Department of Education, Professor Anne-Marie Bagnall, Looked After Children Champion for Northern Ireland at the Education Authority. Uh, I understand that Professor Bagnell has recently been awarded an MBE as well, so congratulations on that uh, account also. And Eilish McDaniel, Director of Child Care and Family Policy, Department of Health. By way of welcome, uh, can I say that on a number of occasions, the department has sought to revise and improve its support for looked after children, and predecessor education committees have also scrutinized this important area of policy. I, I think that it is welcome that the current iteration of this strategy includes both education and health and extends to care experience children and young people. Can I advise the officials that the committee uh, will give you 15 minutes to make your opening statement, uh, perhaps setting out what the status of the strategy is and including something about the role of the looked after children champion, followed by a question from members. I think, Ricky, you're leading off again. Chair, 
Eilish McDaniel is going to open um, for us. Okay. Uh, have we got her on online? I don't think we do. We want to wait a minute. Just uh, I've emailed the Daldo, she's not there. We can either put you in the hot seat, Ricky, or uh, take a, a momentary pause to uh, save you from that. Well, I could. I have a, a brief statement that was going to follow on from Ali, so I could maybe do that first. Yeah, you uh, and we'll see if Ali joins. That, that's that sounds sensible. If if you make your statement, and then hopefully we'll have Ali uh, uh, with us afterwards to, to to take her statement as well. Then that okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, so um, I'd like to focus a bit on the journey we in education have had, um, which led to this first strategy for us, dedicated to. Um, looked after children. Um, we commissioned the OECD 2016 case study called Improving the Educational Outcomes for Looked After Children to help us pinpoint the most effective interventions for these children and young people. Supporting them had been a priority for the department for a number of years up to that point, albeit with limited success and a refocus was required. The, the case study included a number of key themes which have informed our approach going forward. Uh, so these included the need for <clears throat> a coordinated strategic approach between health and education with strategic priorities set from the perspective of the child, the need for a focus on well-being through which programs to support the well-being and achievement of all children with specific programs supporting the particular needs of looked after children be integrated within an overarching strategy. Um, the need for the identification of the key drivers behind poor outcomes and addressing these in an integrated way. The need for a steward identified from within existing governance structures to build a truly child-centered approach to the care, education uh, and well-being of looked after children. Uh, and the need for provision for looked after children to be harmonized across agencies with interagency working needs uh, and needs regularly reviewed. And also the need to remove removal of any barriers, including insufficient funding, staff time, um, quality home placements and underinvestment in research uh, and program evaluation. Uh, and finally then the need for monitoring data and research. Data can then be used to track gaps in provision and identify areas for improvement. Uh, and a robust evidence base for for interventions. So, taking these findings from the OECD report into consideration, we then took two main steps. Um, we agreed with the Department of Health that a joint strategy would be developed, uh, and we developed a pilot which would test the role of a champion for children and young people who are looked after. And this champion had the role of identifying the key interventions to raise educational outcomes at key stage two level and to improve multi-agency working, challenge existing supports and identifying and, re and responding early when they looked after children um, needed that additional support. So the education element of the joint strategy then focuses on building on the success of that pilot of the champion for children and young people looked after by establishing the role on a permanent basis within the education authority, supported by a new support service, as well as targeting um, the following areas. So providing tailored support to looked after children in education to ensure they have a positive and engaging learning experience, enhancing access to that support resources and training for educational settings, building capacity <clears throat> within education on trauma and attachment, um, reviewing and adapting the personal education planning process and coordinating this with the personal learning plans for children and young people with SEN that we've just discussed. Um, identifying the primary causes of the educational attainment gap and measures to address it. Uh, and developing an effective multi-agency approach. So we believe that all of these elements combined will transform the experience of education for our children and young people who are looked after. Um, and Chair, members of the committee, again, thank you for this opportunity to up update you on the progress. Um, I'm not sure if Alish has been able to join us during that time. Possibly not, by the looks of it. No, no I, th I think she has. Good, perfect timing, Ricky. Okay. There we are. I'll hand over to Alish then. Clockwork, Ricky, well done. <laughs>
Uh, apologies that I, that I joined the, the um, session um, a bit um, late, um, but good morning um, no to um, all. Um, I, I just want to thank um, the committee um, for the opportunity um, to um, bring um, members on the new strategy for looked after children um, and care experienced children, um, which we've entitled A Life Deserved um, Caring for Children and Young People in Northern Ireland. Um, I intend to briefly set out the background to the development of the strategy and the case for change, its overarching aims and objectives, and I'll also provide an overview of the strategy's um, key commitments um, to action other than those that I think Ricky has already um, outlined. Um, firstly, um, I'd like to thank the children and young people, their carers, their parents and advocates who have helped in the development of this strategy, and without them, um, we wouldn't have been able um, to reach um, this important um, milestone. Turning to the development of the strategy then, um, as members will be aware from the Health and Education Minister's correspondence, um, the new strategy will replace the existing strategy, Care Matters in Northern Ireland, a bridge to a better future, which was endorsed by the executive um, back in 2009. It has been introduced at a time when there are more children in care than at any time since the introduction of the Children Northern Ireland Order in 1995. And at the end of September 2019, there were 3,362 children in care. Numbers have continued to increase during the pandemic, and there are now 125 more children in care than at the start of April um, this year, so at, at the 23rd of November. Um, there were 3,474 children um, in care. Since April, there's also been a 58% increase in the number of referrals to children's social services. And we're Alice, also seeing I, increasing numbers of children on the sorry, Child Protection can Register. For a second, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm recalling the advice we were given to Chairperson's Liaison Group to try and ensure that your camera um, covers your all of your, your face so that um, we can anyone that might need to lip read is able to do so as well is that can you uh, uh yep is there that, on. that looks that looks good now thank you thanks for that okay okay so um, maybe sorry maybe just slightly lower apologies the cap there you go that's you okay that's great thank you um, thanks so um, I've explained that um, since April of this year, there's been a 58% increase in the number of referrals to children's social services. And we're also seeing an increase in the number of children on the Child Protection Register. So an increase of 67 um, between the 30th of September 2019 and the 23rd of November 2020. These pressures across children's services are expected to continue. And to increase as a result of COVID-19 related factors such as family breakdown, financial worries and employment concerns. In addition to the rise in numbers of children and young people in care, there is also um, increasing complexity of need within our current looked after um, and care labour population, including comparatively higher numbers of children um, with disabilities, learning disabilities, mental and emotional ill health and substance misuse issues. So, for example, 13% of all looked after children have a disability, and of that number, 37% have a learning disability. This carries through to aftercare support, with up to 15% of care leavers at age 19 having a disability. There are also higher rates of young parents in care and, the care, and in the care leaver population. I think it's important um, to note before I get into what's not um, so good um, that um, there are many children and young people um, in care who have happy and fulfilling experiences um, uh, in care and, uh, and achieve their um, full potential. However, we know that 40% of the after children enter care from the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. And in 1718, 43% of children were taken into care from the 20% most deprived areas within Northern Ireland. In comparison, around 5% of children originated from the 20% least deprived areas. Research has shown that it's more likely that children in those areas will experience health and social inequalities, such as lower life expectancy, higher suicide rates, higher rates of mental ill health, more mood and anxiety disorders, and more instances of self-harm, higher rates of alcohol-related deaths, higher drug-related deaths, greater likelihood of becoming involved in the criminal justice system, reduced income, 
and increased homelessness and uh, unemployment. In other words, many children and young people enter care um, on the back foot, making it necessary to do everything possible to support and enable them to reach their full potential and to close the attainment gap between them and their non-care experienced peers. This was recognised in the draft programme for government, which included an outcome to give children and young people the best start in life and a commitment, a very specific commitment to improve support for looked after children. In the executive children and young people strategy, children and care and care leavers are identified as a particularly vulnerable group who require additional support to reach their full potential. New Decade New Approach provided a further commitment to support a number of strategies, including um, the children and young people's um, strategy. And this new strategy for looked after children will be one of the key delivery mechanisms to support the actions identified in the children and young people strategy. The overall aim of the strategy is to improve the well-being of care experienced children and young people and to give them um, the best chance of the life they each deserve. We're well, well aware of the need for uh, and benefits of early intervention approaches and particular supports um, needed during times of transition. As a result, the strategy does not solely focus on children who are currently in care or looked after. It extends to those um, who are on the edges of care including children um, with intense needs who require intensive support at home, those returning home from a period in care, and those leaving care to make the journey into adult life. It's also intended to extend to children who are adopted from care or who live, leave care to live with someone other than their birth parents, so for example, under um, a private law order like a residence order. The strategy is rights-based and is firmly anchored to the Children's Services Cooperation Act, which requires government departments and children's authorities to cooperate with each other to improve wellbeing. Wellbeing within um, the strategy has the same meaning as wellbeing in the Children's Services Cooperation Act and in the wider children's strategy, which the Act um, requires the executive to adopt. By way of action under the strategy, um, the aim is to, as far as possible, ensure the care experienced children live in a society in which equality of opportunity and good relations are promoted, that they are physically and mentally healthy and living in safety and stability, that they are learning and achieving and enjoying play and leisure, and finally, that they experience economic and environmental well-being and are enabled to make a positive contribution um, to Northern Ireland society. Within the world of looked after children, the term corporate parent is well understood and captures the responsibilities of health and social care trusts to look after children. The strategy introduces the concept of the corporate family, which recognises that trusts need the support of other public authorities, government departments, their arms length, body, their arms length bodies, local government and indeed voluntary community and independent sector organisations to effectively deliver improvements in the well-being of care experienced children and young people. Turning to what we will do um, to improve um, the well-being of care experienced children and young people, there are 61 commitments and um, action in the strategy, and I know that Ricky has outlined um, some of them. Um, so um, the key actions um, include um, a cross-departmental family and parenting support strategy um, to promote positive parenting, help to build resilient, stable and strong families and meet the needs of families experiencing um, greater levels of challenge. We will enhance family support hubs to reach a greater number of families who need early help services, which may prevent um, the involvement of social services at a later stage. A new way of working within social services known as um, the Signs of Safety Practice Model will continue to be rolled out and that's a strengths-based um, approach um, which seeks to involve the wider family and friends network um, to keep children safe and well. A new framework of integrated um, therapeutic care will be rolled out across looked after children's services to ensure that the care provided um, is person-centered and therapeutic. It will place an emphasis on relationship-focused work and will provide the basis for securing safety and stability for the child. And under the framework, practitioners will build an understanding of the child's presenting needs and put in place therapeutic supports and interventions for the child, their families and carers to help them build positive relationships 
and uh, support a range of improved outcomes. In fostering, um, we will continue to work to attract greater numbers of committed individuals into this critical role through robust marketing campaigns informed by foster carers and organisations um, who work with them. Foster carers know best on what will attract individuals and families into fostering and what we need to do to support them in terms uh, and what we need, what we need to do um, to support them to um, enable them um, to um, stay in the role. We're introducing more mother and baby placements to allow young mothers to remain in foster care and with their baby after the child's birth. We're also expanding specialist foster care placement to support young people with additional needs, such as children with a disability, those with challenging um, behaviour or unaccompanied asylum seeking um, children. In residential care, we're introducing peripatetic support teams to improve multidisciplinary support to young people who may be in, in crisis to, among other things, uh, prevent entry into the criminal justice system where looked after children um, are overrepresented. So, for example, in 2018-19, all of the young people in custody, of all of the young people in custody, custody, 39% of them were in care. We're also expanding flexible outreach services to support um, uh, looked after um, children um, when they're particularly vulnerable, such as in the evening or at weekends. And there will also be a capital program for residential provision for children with a disability. For children and young people leaving care, we're introducing post-permanent support teams. For example, the teams will work with children who have left care through adoption, who continue to need support to perhaps deal with early trauma and to minimise the risk of their new family home breaking down. We will continue to work with the Department for Communities and the Housing Executive to expand the accommodation options for care experienced young people, including those leaving um, care, um, which keep them safe and offer them a stable and supported home base from which to pursue a career, training or further education. We're introducing a new capital scheme, the um, Staying Connected scheme, which will enable <laughs> children and young people to stay longer, and that's with ours, stay closer, um, and by that we mean um, close to their last placement, having aged out of care, or to stay together, and, and that means with their um, sibling and group. This could involve making it possible for a foster carer to extend with home or a trust to purchase property <coughs> to purchase property within close proximity to a children's home. For unaccompanied asylum seeking children, and we intend to introduce a regional social work assessment, reception and advisory service for um, separated traffic and unaccompanied children. <coughs> that is the knowledge, the skills, the expertise and experience necessary to address the needs of and provide appropriate support to the in increasing numbers of unaccompanied children arriving in Northern Ireland. <coughs> we invest around £10 million to establish a new regional purpose-built residential facility for unaccompanied um, children, which will increase capacity. Work has already started with the Department of Justice to establish a joint regional care and justice campus in place of current secure care and juvenile justice arrangements. The campus will include a secure care centre, an on-site step-down um, facility and community-based satellite services. Work is being um, taken forward within the department on a new mental health strategy and in relation to CAMS, a managed care network for children and young people with acute and high-intensity care needs will be established. A holistic health appraisal will be introduced in place of the current annual medical assessment arrangements and this will involve and school nurses. The views of children and young people um, were important, important and hugely helpful in the development of the strategy, and they will be equally important in implementation. Among other things, we will introduce a biennial survey to gather the views of care experienced children and young people and those responsible for their care. We assess whether they consider um, outcomes are improving for them. Legislation will be required to deliver some actions and this will be done by way of uh, an adoption of children bill, which the health minister intends to introduce in the assembly early in the new year. Um, in relation to care experienced children, um, the bill will place advocacy arrangements on a statutory basis, require trusts to publish details of the services they offer in their area to young people um, when they've left care, enshrine corporate parenting principles in, in law, 
enable disabled children to avail of short break care away from their families without needing to be looked after by a health and social care trust. We will strengthen care planning arrangements and the operation of foster panel arrangements. We'll place a duty on health and social care trusts to undertake an assessment of need for adoption support services. Extending um, support for care leavers up to age 25 to enable them to continue in or return to education or training. And finally, um, we will place a duty on health and social care trusts to promote the educational achievement of looked after children and young people and to minimise disruption to their education when making decisions about where they will live. We um, have already been able to secure recurrent funding for some actions. Others will be cost neutral and some will require new funding. Further bids for recurrent resources in future years um, will be made to secure the, requ the required funding. Um, but it's not only about new investment, um, it's also about doing um, things differently um, with existing resources. And we've trialled some initiatives using transformation funding available both to the Department of Health and the Department of Education, and um, that has worked um, very well. So turning to um, success and measures, um, in measuring, in terms of measuring how well we're doing an implementation, and um, the, the intention is to introduce a report card um, with performance measures or indicators and um, associated um, with each of the strategy's outcomes. And work is progressing on the identification of appropriate indicators informed by responses um, on the draft um, to consultation on the draft strategy. We will um, use a range of methods to measure performance. We will collect and analyse data, building on existing data sets, undertake surveys of children, parents and professionals, evaluate new services, commission research um, where this is considered appropriate, and initiate inspections and reviews. It's important that we um, deliver tangible, lasting um, improvements in wellbeing outcomes. So what will success um, look like? Um, potentially um, fewer children in care, improved health and education outcomes, the attainment gap closing, greater numbers of care leavers in further and higher education, living in stable homes and generally doing well in adulthood, care experienced children um, who are loved, who feel loved and know how to love with ease in return, in short, um, living the lives they deserve to live and that we are collectively um, duty bound to make possible. Um, so at this point, um, that concludes um, my presentation and to committee and very happy um, to take any follow up questions um, that you might have. Okay. Thanks very much indeed for your initial um, presentations. Um, can I just start by checking the status of the strategy? Okay, so, so it, it, it's currently um, with both committees. Um, uh, uh, it's with the, yourselves, it's also with the um, health committee and um, ministers then will um, seek um, executive um, approval um, to publish um, the, strat the strategy and commit, uh, uh, commence implementation um, fairly soon. And we hope that we'll be able to do that before the end of um, this year, so within the month of December. Okay. And can I can I maybe offer uh, Professor Bagnell an opportunity to, to speak and maybe say a bit about the nature of the looked after children champion role? Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. And just for the record, Chair, can I just put right that I am not professor? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, we've we've we've. we've We've bestowed that honour upon you. Apologies. <laughs> okay, I'm certainly not professor in any way. Um, you, the, the, still the an, ex an, an extremely important role, nonetheless. So very, very glad to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much, Be Blair. Um, my my role, really, um, chair, was to take on the role of children looked after champion, uh, and initially, um, in, in keeping with the o o C OECD report that we needed to get a better evidence base of what works for children in Northern Ireland. So I initially set out a task of undertaking 
um, an analysis of existing interventions across Northern Ireland. What is out there to improve outcomes, educational outcomes for Dr. And to, take, to look at a gap analysis against national and international benchmarks. The, the findings of that were very, very interesting. How did we do it first? We facilitated a number of stakeholder events across the region for education, health and social care and other key children looked after partners. We were trying to determine what was working for these children in education, what is out there and what is working, what are the barriers to education and learning and how could we collectively across education, health and social care overcome such barriers. We, in addition, work in partnership with VoIPEC and with Foster Network to ensure the voice of the child and our key stage two carers were central to our planning process. We completed a, a desktop review and we also carried out a multi-agency survey. How effective was multi-agency working across health, education and social care? The key things, there was key things emerged from that and, I, and I'm sure I'll come on to talk about the interventions. But what we, what we got from the, the research was that there was an absence of child-centered approaches, uh, which was also supported by the OECD report. It described the evidence base in Northern Ireland as not robust, a need for better joined up approach, more collaboration across health, social care and education. There was a greater need for placement stability, including family and school placements. For all professionals to have higher expectations for children looked after in education, we needed better data collection and better data sharing. There was a lot of limitations identified in terms of the 2011 personal education plan, uh, limitations to the support that led to, to a widening gap of, the, of attainment for children looked after, a lack of training across education and social care, and this was really around trauma and attachment and the impact of trauma and attachment on learning and development. Education staff highlighting a need to have a better understanding of the health and social care system. Social care staff highlighting a need to better understand the education system. And we all know here today how fast and ever changing the education system is. Limitations of psychology support. And there was a need for a single point of contact in education for children looked after. And I suppose that is where my my, my role come in. I was there to try and identify what is a better way of working with these children to improve outcomes and then to implement that service across EA with key stage two. Say again, an, Say. Extreme, uh, an extremely important role. And, and are you, you confident that you will be able to implement some of the changes that need to happen? And perhaps I could also ask, um, you mentioned interventions. It, it's my understanding yeah. that uh, early intervention key stage two looked after children ed education project uh, currently exists and also an attach program described as yeah. a trauma and attachment informed multidisciplinary interagency relationship based approach to well-being exists could you maybe say okay. something about those yeah hmm. so out of, out of those uh, out of the research chair then we i devised a suite of interventions that i felt would improve uh, educational outcomes we had a universal helpline available to all so that we could provide advisory support and to prevent drift and delay in decision making within education. We also had a huge amount of targeted support. We assigned members of our team and just to say that our team was multidisciplinary and interagency in nature also. Like the OECD report identified, we needed to have better collaboration and better joint working. So we actually have social workers, youth workers, clinical psychology, education psychology, and our partners of the EA Youth Service work alongside us as well. So we're very multidisciplinary and interagency in approach. So we assigned one of those people to each of the schools, and that was chaired to have a relationship. We needed to start building a relationship with these schools in order to help them understand the needs of these children better. And we also wanted to have eyes on every single key stage child. We wanted to know how they were doing in school, look at the data and be able to prioritise our resource and need. We asked our schools, similar to an approach in England, to appoint a school name contact. That was generally a senior leadership member of staff uh, and we wanted them, they come out to all of our training, we wanted them to be a champion for these children within the school and to advocate their needs in the school. Uh, we also asked all of the five trusts 
to appoint a trust name contact. And that was really to raise the profile of the importance of education for children looked after within health and social care. Uh, and it was also very good for me. I had a single point of contact. It improved communication, it improved multi-agency working. And when we identified problems with some children, we could actually look <coughs> at what was going on, review the problem and identify a, a, a solution to that problem in terms of additional training. Um, what came out of it, Chair, very clear, was that there was a very big need for training. Um, and I'll talk to you first just about the ATTACH project. The ATTACH project is a collaboration between education and also Belfast Trust Therapeutic Support Services, headed up by Dr. Mark Honaghy. Um, the, the, the independent evaluation has highlighted, that, highlighted this and given special mention. Those two perspectives working together, education and clinical psychology, for children looked after has had really good outcomes. So what we do here, we are trying to provide an attachment figure for these children in school. What we do know is that some of these children, sometimes due to their trauma, not all children, but some of them, are feeling very unsafe within a, within a school environment. We need to make them feel safe, and we do that by establishing good relationships with key people in school. Um, we take that school name contact out and the key adult and back up key adult for that child and we train them intensively in trauma and attachment. In addition, we then take, we, we do a half day whole school awareness training. We want every single member of that school team to understand the needs of children looked after from attach, an attachment and trauma perspective. Every single person, staff in the canteen, supervisor staff, caretakers, everybody who may come into contact with this child needs to understand them from a trauma perspective. And I can say that one of our schools has come back and said, since the whole school training, he used to have a line of children outside his door after break time and lunch time, all in structured times. And since the training and developing that understanding of all of his staff team, those numbers have reduced. And in fact, there are many days he looks out the door and there's not a child to be seen. Uh, within TAPL, we support the implementation. So we support the implementation of, of this approach. We are not training staff and walking away from them. We, we are there supporting them day and daily. We want them to implement this at a whole school level and at an individual level for each child. We also do consultations with staff. And within that consultation process, we are supporting our, our education staff. We all know that working with traumatized children is very, very difficult. So we need to care for the, for the staff who are caring for our children in order for them to do the best that they can for our children. And finally, for those children who are hard to reach and who are at risk of breakdown, we will provide an intensive service in terms of a clinical assessment, formulation and recommendations. And I can say, Chair, that any school that has had this detailed comprehensive report the report will tell the school very clearly how this child will present in school, why they're presenting in the way. It's a stress response because of the fear and the anxiety that they're feeling. They will give them a detailed uh, number of strategies to help this child to settle, to feel safe, to feel connected, and ultimately to settle to learn. Um, in terms of um, trauma attachment and form spaces, we also resourced them to go into schools uh, and we wanted them in the classrooms because we know that schools are not resourced to withdraw children into quiet spaces. So we resourced that in each of the schools so that it, there is a space in a classroom that a child can self-regulate or staff can co-regulate with them as well. Um, also with OC, OECD highlighted that we do not have good research and robust evidence base of what works in Northern Ireland. So we took on a top PhD studentship and that uh, student is doing an implementation study of TAP uh, so that we get the perfect product that we will hopefully be able to manualize and, and roll out right across as a standard training program for the whole of Northern Ireland. We put in a range of other resources, but I'm conscious of time, uh, library of resources, CAM boxes, these children sometimes can have sensory difficulties. This box is portable. They can move that around the school with them, and that enables them to self-regulate or again for staff to co-regulate with them. Other training that we did also was the social care training for school staff. Our school staff were very, very clear that they needed to understand more about the social care system. So we provided that. And also our social workers. 
They needed to understand the education system. As Eilish has said, they are the corporate parent. If they have to advocate for these children, they need to understand admissions, suspensions, expulsions and assessments. Um, also, as Ricky uh, uh, discussed, we have piloted the revised draft PEP guidance. Um, and from, from the 2011 guidance, we are now, education are taking the lead on those PEPs, on the completion of it, but it's very much a collaboration. Um, okay. We do that through a PEP meeting. And again, that is the main delivery vehicle for multi-agency working. And I have to say from the research, the, there has been a fast improvement in collaboration and multi-agency working across education, health and social care. Okay. Within, those PEPs, within those PEPs, we ask for a greater focus on trauma and attachment. We wanted the inclusion of the voice of the child through active participation, smarter, smarter targets, and PEPs were always meant to hold everyone to account. If we have good relationships, we then can give a space for people to be accountable to the targets against their name. And again, in terms of research, we have a PhD studentship who is going to evaluate the, the PEP process. Okay, thank, thank okay. you, thank, Anne-Marie. Thank you. That's a really comprehensive update. And I, I suppose given that the data suggests that 30% have looked after children attain 5A to C GCSEs compared to 80% of the general population, whilst that is far from the only measurement of attainment, um, there is yeah. cause co for concern there, and this type of uh, intervention and work is obviously absolutely vital. I I've used most of my time, so I'll just ask one final question very briefly. The, the, those interventions sound comprehensive. Um, they sound positive. Are, are they at pilot stage, are there adequate resources in place to, sure, uh, to ensure that that level of support is available across the board to all looked after children, um, that that training is available for all teachers, or, or do we need increased resources? Um, uh, Richard, I'll come in. Yeah, I, well, I'll, sorry, Ricky, I'll if, come in. first that was that. If, if Anne Marie would answer that at the start and then come to you, Ricky, okay. thanks. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, we were, we were a pilot stage chair um, from 2016 through to 2020, and DE commissioned. We were very, very keen, DE and EA were very keen to have an independent evaluation. We really want to know that the, the children were better off. So that has now been completed, and it's sitting with DE at the, at the moment with the minister. Um, and there's plans, there's plans afoot in terms of moving forward to roll this out. The evaluation recommended an expansion to the primary sector, so foundation, key stage one, key stage two. So business cases are in, in place to, to think about rolling this out across that primary sector. Okay. What key stage does it apply to in the pilot stage? Key stage two only. Only? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ricky, do you want to come in on that as well? I think Chair Amory's covered it there. Um, the evaluation was very positive. Um, the pilot has been successful. The um, outcomes show substantial improvement in terms of attainment levels at key stage two. So we have clear recommendations there uh, and we're working through the business case process in terms of how we put that on a more permanent footing going forward. That, that's that's the key the key task here, Ricky, isn't it? Uh, uh, as as positive as they are these are. Um, I mean, surely yep. the strategy has to rule this out for all looked after children and, and all teachers. And the, another question would have been to ask how um, foster carers are in, included in the personal education plan decision making processes as well. But I'm conscious I, I better move on here. So uh, you'll be able to come in and other questions, I'm sure, officials. Uh, Karen Mullen, MLA, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for your briefing this morning. Uh, Amory, I suppose the first one will be directed at yourself. It's your role is very welcomed and a vital role. And just listen to yourself speaking and and the chair question in there. Um, and just thinking to myself, we 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 obviously would need more than one of you, Amory. Um, and given the level of work that needs to be done, I suppose a lot of looked after children don't have a good experience it's at at school. Um, some yeah. teachers lack understanding where they're coming from. Um, and what is going on for, for these children and they, they go through their whole school life feeling isolated. Uh, I'll give you a personal experience of mine and it's very recent of my niece. Um, we are a kinship care family. She went through the whole primary school 
um, and I don't believe that any teacher understood her throughout that time, um, which has uh, led to issues in itself now. But uh, there was no allowances made. I think because she was such a good child, she was a very quiet child, she never had any behavioural issues, and she's only 15 now, but to me she was forgotten. Um, and yeah. it's those forgotten children that um, worry and concern me. I hear the extent of the work that has been done. Um, I actually attended one of the consultation events that, was, that had taken place a number of years ago in relation to the strategy. I suppose at that time my sense was it was very, the majority of people there were, were health um, and education was very minimal, but listening to yourselves today, the extent, you know, the extent of the work that is there and what is, is looking to be achieved. I suppose, Amory, firstly, would be you, you talked about um, the, the champion within the school. So, back to my original, what I started off with. Have you had any feedback from the children uh, in relation to the school champion or um, any feedback from the children themselves that there has, has been a change or they have noted a, a change for themselves in their school journey at present? Yeah, uh, thank you. Karen, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your, your niece. Um, I suppose we hear the voice of the child, Karen, very, very much through the PEP. Um, and the research has identified that they really, really welcome that key adult, that key adult and backup key adult and that relationship that they have with those people. They really, really welcome those. Uh, and we see that very, very evidently coming through the PEPs in terms of the targets we're setting for them. Children, children in the research, Karen, were very much highlighting a good school for them is a school that they have relationships with teachers, classroom assistants and peers. And that is what we are trying to work towards. We are trying to, to give them safety, give them connection through relationships. And, and, and that's why our training is very important. We have to help schools to understand these children from that trauma and attachment perspective. Why they present the way they do that is actually a stress response. It's not a misbehavior. And when we do that, Karen, we tend to find that they are the schools are so much more empathetic and understand the need for better connection and better understanding. Yeah, thank you, Amory. Elish, if I could ask yourself, um, you, you give us a, in, in your report uh, the figures around the increases over the last number of months. I was wondering if you could give us the main reasons for for that you are finding in terms of the increase of those in care um, uh, and the referrals since April, and what extra support and interventions has been put in place and how social workers and the service adapted um, over that period to be able to provide the service? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think it is because families are in difficulty, if I'm perfectly um, honest um, with you. Um, families are genuinely um, struggling at, at the minute. I think lockdown itself um, created um, difficulties um, for families, you know, particularly if a family's living in a, in a, in a small house um, where nobody's able to go anywhere. I think that created um, family pressures and, and we're all aware of the issue of domestic violence and, and the increase that there was um, with it um, during lockdown um, in particular. So if you've got family um, pressure, um, those families will undoubtedly come to the attention of um, social services, depending on the um, nature of that pressure and, and what it means for children and young people. Unfortunately, some of them may well end up in the child protection register and if harm to those children is deemed to be considered uh, to, to be significant, then a number of them will end up um, in the um, care system. That doesn't mean that they will remain in the care system forever, um, hopefully, and, and we should be able to work with families um, uh, to get some of those children um, back home again. And, and we, in terms of the supports that we um, put um, in place, I mean, there was support put in place um, for um, foster carers, initially a, a fairly small amount of money um, to help them, um, I suppose, keep children um, amused in those um, very um, early um, days. And then um, over time, we introduced um, uh, further financial um, supports. Um, we actually um, increased um, the adoption or fostering allowance by around 20%. 
um, and that was in relation to the, the, the household and food elements of the fostering um, allowance. So every foster care in Northern Ireland um, would have um, received that. Um, we also provided, um, and that, this has happened more recently, provided supports um, to um, children's homes um, and because you know there, there are difficulties within children's homes too. Although interestingly, at one stage in the pandemic in the earlier um, stages, um, homes were actually reporting um, greater levels of stability simply because um, there was um, less frequent movement um, in and out of homes. Um, because of the the, the, the fear of um, the, the the spread of an, an infection and that, but we did invest um, more recently around 3.3 million in children's homes to um, help with some of the challenges that both um, children and staff um, are experiencing um, there. I hope that answers um, your question, um, Deputy Chair. Yeah, thanks, Eilish. I, th I suppose rightly, you know, um, uh, it's unfortunately. It's a sad reality, and um, it, it worryingly, you know, it was not to be, you know, unexpected that that this possibly would happen. For what many children and families actually they live through. So I suppose coming out of it, and it's probably too early, Eilish. Maybe it's something that we can get in the future. Would be that learning of how the whole social care adapted, um, and how you know um, the lessons learned. And maybe going forward on how that that can improve getting to those um, I suppose most vulnerable and most disconnected from all of the services and, and how you get to those hard to reach so that'll be something maybe in the future that um, we'd be interested just finally chair a question for for Ricky um, Ricky I suppose in the committee we're all too aware of the the shortcomings in, in all our areas of work where the cooperation between departments has not been what it should be. I know Eilish gave a lot of detail um, and, and you had given detail when you'd reported, but could you give us maybe a wee bit more in relation to how effective cross-departmental working is in relation to supporting looked after children? And we've talked a lot here today about education and health, but I'd be particularly interested around economy. And the you know the opportunities for young people when when leaving school. I know that the strategy is extended to age 25, but obviously them teenage years are the most difficult. They're the the hardest years, particularly to keep young people um, in education, but give them the best opportunities that there is. So, Ricky, would you be able to give us anything in relation to economy's role? Um, I think, Karen, the strategy is probably the basis of how we um, maintain that cross-departmental um, working. In terms of direct engagement with economy, has there been anything? Has, you want to add? Yeah. Uh, we have a joint group with economy that I co-chair with a colleague from economy, and it's to develop pathways through education, further education, higher education, and into employment. Mm. Um, so that would be our main focus through economy. It is referenced in the strategy itself. Thank you. And there's the ongoing review of the 16 to 19 year old strategy as well that has been going on for quite a while. And I think any of the sessions that I've been at myself, I was um, asking to ensure that looked after children were on that. So I suppose it'll be included in that work as well. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Thank you, Chair. And uh, can I again welcome the panel uh, to the meeting? Uh, I I mean, it's really good to hear about the strategy and indeed to hear about the success of the pilot. Uh, so thank you. Can I ask you a very quick question first? Uh, um, can I ask about the children who are at risk in their own home? Are they included within this piece of work? So if, if, I, if I could give that, um, Chair, um, I mean, I, I did say in, in the um, presentation that um, the strategy not only extends to children who are in the care system, it also extends to children who we describe it within the strategy as being on the edges of care, and that does include um, children um, who might have particular um, needs and whose families have particular needs and actually are at risk of coming um, into care. So the intention is to provide um, supports um, within 
and the family home. And of course, you know, that's what, that's one of the purposes of the child protection system um, too. You know, children do remain at home um, where there are certain levels of, of risk, um, but that risk is managed through the child protection system. The child protection register is, is a mechanism and within that and child protection planning likewise it, it is a measure and within that to keep those children at home but in, in a very um, uh, well um, risk managed um, way through protection planning. Well, that's, that's very welcome I have to say uh, Chair. Can I maybe refer to your paragraph five of the uh, report looked after children a dedicated educational support service and if we can achieve that uh, I, I think that would be be, be a, an excellent piece of work. But within that paragraph, you have a, a sentence, early intervention to prevent problems becoming entrenched cannot be assured if the pupil support services at board level are not aware that a child is looked after. How could that possibly break down and there be a lack of communication there? Angela? Um, do you mean in terms of the identification of the children themselves? Well, I, I assume that's what you're meaning there, there earlier. Yeah. yeah. If the pupils... Yes. The child... Um, be, yeah. yeah. We have had um, a lot of work done by the champion in, in her own project in trying to identify these children. Because when we are identifying them through our own supports, we use the census data, which is proven to be problematic because it is a year out of date. So what they have done through the Education Authority is a cleansing exercise to identify the children that are currently looked after. And this is done on a regular basis to make sure that we are providing resources to the children that do actually need it. Okay. So really what you're trying to do is make sure that that doesn't happen. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Can I, uh, on page, certainly page 197 of our um, pack, it refers to the number of children looked after children in Northern Ireland as being 3,281. It then refers to the number um, of children in education, 2,635. That's nearly 650 children who you describe as not being in education. How do we get to a situation where 650 children are not engaging in any form of education? So the, two th the 2,600 number yeah. is from the 2019-20 school census uh, and reflects children who are pupils at schools in primary, post-primary, special uh, and in preschool. Um, so that's from the census. So the additional um, 600 are those who are probably outside of the school system because they've um, they've left school, uh, they've reached compulsory school age, or they've gone on to further higher education um, or training or something like that. Can, can I just add to that too? I mean, they may not be of school age at all. So, you know, a number of children Lord, in care yeah. actually, um, you know, are, are haven't reached the age of um, four at all. So a large yeah. number, that's 100, um, will be not of school age. So would you, at least they haven't just reached the stage to engage in primary education? Hmm. Okay. Yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Okay. Can I, can I again raise with you, uh, again, it's for in our packets, page 199. The LAC teams were to provide training for foster carers in their role as primary educator. It also informed that the policy was to be developed to extend alternative education placements beyond compulsory years. Are the LAC teams actually doing that, providing foster carers with support or education in, in primary education. Is that happening? Is that for Amory? Okay. Amory, could you pick that one up? Yep. Uh, what we're what we're actually doing is we are um we're training foster network staff um across the region and they are then disseminating all of our training. 
So we actually recognize that the foster carers are primary educators and then need to be trained in all of those areas. So that is what we commissioned Foster Network to do. So at the moment, they have attended all of our training and we're now about to, to try and co-work that and disseminate that out to all foster carers across Northern Ireland. Okay, and the policy was to be developed to extend alternative education placements beyond compulsory school age. Are we able to address that in the strategy? No. Um, I'm not sure that that's, that's something we probably need to look at and come back um, to you on, Robin. To be, to be honest, I can't answer that today. Okay, okay. Well, there might, there might, there might just be a role there for economy in that. I'm only suggesting there might be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've also, I don't know whether you've seen it or, or not, but the uh, assembly who provided us with um, a, a, a briefing paper, um, and they're referring to uh, key statistics on looked after children. By comparison with, uh, by with the general school population, in terms of general school population, 80% achieve GCSEs at A star to C, but looked after children, 27% achieve five GCSEs at A star to C. And also indicate to us that the Suspensions in the general school population, 1.3%, are <coughs> five times higher in, in looked after children. Um, can I just ask, in terms of the 27%, this is a bit of a crystal ball gazing figure, I suppose, but are there any targets set for how we might have the looked after children? up to what is the general school population target? I think, Robin, that's the purpose of the strategy, certainly uh, in terms of the education element. Uh, and, you know, the first phase um, that has emerged from the OECD work has been the pilot, which has looked at um, key stage two educational um, attainment. And what we knew which was a pretty substantive decline between key stage one and key stage two. So we now know from that project that the interventions that Anne-Marie has set out um, actually mitigate that decline quite significantly. So we want to initially try to put that process within education on a permanent footing. Beyond that, I think we probably need to do more research when we get into post-primary mm -hmm. uh, and because not necessarily the same interventions would have the same impact. So we need to research that more and then um, design whatever interventions would be needed to reduce that attainment gap between looked after children at GCSE and, and non looked after children. No, so that's further work that needs to be done. I think that's fair comment. I don't think that's fair comment. Can, can I ask you about then the, the, the training? Uh, uh, teacher education training and uh, again references made within the research document John Willis University College um, uh, three post postgraduate uh, modules on children in care St Mary's may opt to take a module or may not Queen's University Issues associated with looked after children are touched on. University of Ulster, issues around looked after children are not specifically mentioned in training, sorry, in teaching. Um, is there not a need for a, a, some sort of foundation within our teacher training to embed that knowledge within the teacher training? and ensure that the supply of teachers is uh, then able to, to address the matter? Um, I would say that there absolutely is. Uh, we recognise that Sean Millis are very far ahead down that road in terms of specifically unlooked after children and on the other side of it, trauma-informed attachment. And we know 
no party is leading the way there in Stranmillis. Um, but certainly I would accept the point we do need to and we will engage with the other providers to make sure that that is brought forward. I think, Angela, if I could just say as well, I think we're in a better position now. We're in a better yes. position because we've done the pilots. We know what works and we have the research and the outcomes. So we're in a better position now to, to talk to universities in terms of our learning and bringing it forward. Okay, Chair, I just finish by saying I, I think that the approach is, is, is uh, first class. Uh, I do think that the for achieving uh, improved educational outcomes for looked after children, I think the four strands that you're provi providing within your approach are, are, are first class and uh, a good building block to, to, be, to, to build the, 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 the strategy on. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Some great discussion. Uh, what is driving the increase in the number of looked after children from around 2,500 uh, in 2009 to over 3,000 now? Um, Alice, can you can you pick that one up? Yeah, I think there's probably um, quite a few reasons um, for it. Um, you know, I do think families are experiencing greater levels of um, difficulty and you know we can ignore um, issues like um, poverty um, etc mm -hmm. that impact on on a parent's ability and um, to parent um, well in, in some cases so I do think there are probably quite a few reasons why it might actually um, be um, the case it's not unique to Northern Ireland and um, you know so the numbers have been increasing um, across um, the UK um, where I expect the same family challenges are being um, experienced. I mean, we do have higher levels of um, deprivation here in Northern Ireland, and children in Northern Ireland actually come from, um, sorry, a higher proportion of children in Northern Ireland actually live in um, more deprived um, areas. I think the comparison is something like 36% of our children population, that's the under 18s. Um, live in deprived areas compared to, I think the figure is 26% um, in Wales and Scotland and 24% um, in England. You know, so I think levels of deprivation themselves um, actually um, probably lead to um, the state having to intervene um, in the lives of the family and, and to, to take children um, into care. I, I don't think there is one reason, um, Daniel, is really what I'm saying. Um, but I, I do think deprivation um, contributes um, quite significantly. Um, to, and I've said in my opening statement that 43% of looked after children come from 20% and most deprived um, areas in, in Northern Ireland. Um, thank you. Uh, evidence suggests that looked after children have a high incidence of uh, learning disabilities. Uh, so, just not as is there any indication as to why that's the case? We touched on it there in the first question. And also, um, if, if there is no information, it is not something that the department should be investigating as to why there is such high percentages of it within children, when we look after children. So, um, um, go ahead, Alice. Go ahead, Alice. Um, I mean, I, I was um, going to say that, um, you know, these children, a high proportion of them, have experienced trauma in their very early um, lives. I mean, I do expect that that will have um, pretty detrimental um, effects on their, on their ability um, to learn, um, et cetera. And in response to your question about, is this something we should be investigating? I mean, there is a piece of research underway um, within Queens, which is actually looking at um, children with a disability uh, uh, within the um, looked after um, children and um, populations, so there, there will be some information um, emerging um, from um, that research about why it is actually um, the case, etc. But I mean, I do think early trauma is probably does probably contribute um, quite significantly um, to that. Okay. Um, can you explain the nature and findings of the early intervention key stage two look after children education project? Okay, so 
Um, maybe Anza, you start and Anne Marie then. Yeah. Um, Anne Marie has touched on uh, the findings that were brought forward. Um, so what we have, sorry, I just found this. The high level findings that they uh, provided for us. They said the significant research prior to commencing the project offered an accurate insight into the challenges faced by children looked after cohort and it formed a robust methodology to address the challenges. Um, they found that there was a substantial improvement in attainment with pupils effectively maintaining the level of change during key stage one into key stage two. The indications from the schools that were involved for 2019-20 uh, are that this success was likely to be repeated. However, due to COVID-19, we don't have that data. And there was positive impact on outcomes and experience of pupils, including attitude and confidence, as well as the development of supporting cultures in schools. Then the key role of the project model in supporting the team around the child and the positive impact this has had on the children themselves was highlighted for particular mention. There were significant improvements in multi-agency working, which has been highlighted as a key strength of the project, with teachers and social workers being trained alongside each other, teachers involved with consultations with the clinical psychologist, and a focus on the collective unique psychological impacts faced by the children experiencing trauma. And then they referenced the ATTACH project as one of the key interventions, um, uh, which was a multidisciplinary, and Anne-Marie has already talked about this, interagency relationship-based approach designed to support the team around the child, and highlighted the impact of the trauma on the children, which again, Anne-Marie and Eilish have talked upon. Um, they highlighted past results through the PhD study that has been referenced, and then they culminated in that they recommended that what were the old black teams should be transformed into a new service within the EA. And Ricky has mentioned that we're looking at that at the minute and business cases are being prepared. Okay, thank you. And just a question, Chair, can uh, you explain the role of the, edu uh, of the Educational Economy Forum and how to focus on career pathways for look after children and care experience young people? Uh, yeah, yes, I didn't hear the question. Uh, that came out of a seminar that we had again through the Children Looked After project led by Anne Marie in the form of the champion role, and it identified that there was an, an effective pathways. So we have a terms of reference of how we can take that forward, and we're identifying key work areas. So it is early days at this stage, but we are hopeful that we can chart a path through with our colleagues in economy linking through with the personal education plans that Amory has referenced and making sure that those pathways are effective for them, whether they go to their hiring in training or employment, that there is a clear steer for them. Mm. Okay, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Chair. A uh, little bit of a lag, pressing this button. Uh, this probably does a user error. Thank you, guys. Really, really important session, and it's a very timely session uh, for Ricky, especially probably on the on the heels of the last session, which was the SDN. So, like the deputy chair, I have to declare an interest as as a foster parent, but only in terms of uh, emergency and respite. We don't have anybody at the moment. So uh, I'll not be doing the, the budget the secrets or, but I do have a passion for this and Ailey probably will, will probably respond to most of the points that I, I make or the questions that I raise. So I'm going to start by pitching it from the side of the foster care. Um, and I'm sure the deputy chair would, would back me up on this. Um, can you give me confidence or an idea um, as to the scope limitations or not uh, of the role of the foster carer? Uh, with regard to their input into every looked after child's education. Um, uh, I think that certainly my experience has been in the past uh, that there are uh, sometimes there, either there's a feeling of exclusion, there is absolute exclusion. Um, and th there can be no doubt that in most cases, the foster parent um, it will be the most significant adult in that child's life at that time, perhaps. And certainly, we borne out in testimony that they have huge impacts. Uh, on the transformation of these children. Oh, can you answer that one, Angela? Or is that for? Yeah. Can we, we maybe we start from an education perspective, maybe? Okay. Um, so, I mean, my understanding is that, uh, you know, a, a foster care would be involved in the education of the child 
with the school in the same way that other parents um, would also be involved with the, with the school in terms of the child's education. In terms of specific functions that would have been, I mean, uh, just are the foster cares involved in the personal educational plan? Um, Anne-Marie, yeah. yeah. we will want to mention that yeah. in terms yeah. of the PEP. Do yeah. Go ahead, ahead Anne-Marie. Absolutely, Robbie. Um, we absolutely recognise the important role of, of foster carers within the, the education of looked after children. And I, I have to be honest, Robbie, I think through the revised PEP, uh, the new, new development of that, foster carers are very, very much involved in that. They are part of the core group. And mm -hmm. because, thank you, we were aware through the research that foster carers felt that they didn't have the knowledge, skills or competence to participate in those type of meetings. But we have now piloted through the primary and post-primary sector. And the feedback from the foster parents is that they are actually feeling very involved and are playing a very, very big role in setting targets for children. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, um, that's certainly uplifting to hear that because that certainly hasn't, hasn't been my experience in the past. I'm sure you picked that out, um, Anne-Marie, with regard to the, the consultation process. For anybody that's picking this up online or watching this, I would ask them to turn to page 11 and 12. Not now, but the, the reading in the report I like deserve is incredible. The case for change is astounding. Um, and to be fair, like he did pick out at the very start of this, he set the scene for um, the reality for a lot of these children because, as, as Ellie just pointed out too, a lot of these kids come from a background of trauma um, and, and trouble and so on, and it, and it, is, more it is quite difficult for them. Um, so, yeah, happy enough with that one, and I'll probably pick it up again. I'm really love to see how that one pans out. I may have experience in the future, hopefully. Um, so just in the other couple of questions, probably in, uh, I asked in the last session too, um, transition is a, a really critical point again. We did this in SEN, but, and again, it's the same, possibly even greater for, for looked after children because there's a level of instability that isn't there because even in good foster care, adoption and kinship care, the transition is part of their life and, and, and it's slightly more complicated. So the transitional phase, um, what, what are the safeguards in the transition and what, what is happening there um, to improve what's happening, particularly when, when young people are moving into uh, either further higher education or the, the, the work field? Have we any information on that through the work with economy, Angela? Um, the work with economy for the transitions to further education, higher education is still at an early stage. However, we have focused on transitions through, again, Anne-Marie's project. Uh, from key stage one, key stage two, particularly where that education gap first appears, and we know that that persists then throughout their education. Um, I know that we have piloted certain trans transition programs. Um, again, Anne Ray, I don't know if you want to mention those. Yeah, uh, we have we have worked in partnership, uh, Robbie, with the youth service, uh, Arlene Key, and they have developed a bespoke transition program for for children children looked after moving from uh, primary to post primary. Um, and really and truly what they're trying to do is work with the child right across year eight and trying to improve their personal and social development and encourage their engagement in uh, youth services. The other thing I would say as well, Robbie, is that the transition plans, the PEP plans, mm -hmm. we have had a big, big focus on those transition plans. So we have a transition plan from primary seven into year eight. We, we involve primary schools and post-primary schools and foster parents are, are involved in that. So there is a comprehensive plan in place now for children looked after under the revised guidance around transitions. And, and, and I would include in that, Robbie, transitions between schools. As we know, there can be moves between schools for children as well. And we are, we are asking that there is not a move of a school until there is a transition plan in place. We need to think that through and, and plan for it very, very well. Um, I don't know if this has been picked up in any of the studies, guys. Um, and genuinely, and just this has just just occurred to me in terms of is there still a pro is there still an issue with stigma um, for for children in terms of the voice of the children? Was anything picked up with regard to uh, any issues that they have? Obviously, school can be difficult, as you said, to go to different schools sometimes and, and maybe move multiple times. Um, and then the prevalence of mental ill health and the SEN in looked after children is is higher too. Was, is there anything in terms of that? Uh, a stigma attached to LAC for, for kids was it picked out or is it not really a problem these days? Probably, probably at key stage two, not so much. Uh, Eilish might want to come in on that. Okay, so it absolutely is um, an issue for, for looked after um, children. Um, I do think that they feel um, stigmatised and, and that came through very clearly. 
um, when they were involved in the um, development of the strategy. Now, that's that's partly the purpose of things like Care Day, um, which has now been running for several years now, and, and Boy Pick actually um, leads on, on that um, uh, within Northern Ireland, and it's something that happens across um, the UK. And over the last couple of years, what they've been trying to do is to begin to... Um, erode or dilute that stigma that is attached um, to um, children um, being in, in care. I think we need to do um, a lot more, um, I think, to help with the understanding of what being in care um, actually um, means. I think some people see it as a bad thing, and I think that we need to absolutely um, dispel um, that myth and, and, and help people understand fully um, why these children actually end up um, in care at, um, through absolutely um, fault, um, of their um, own. So a lot done, Robbie. It, it is an issue, uh, but I think there is a lot more to do. Brilliant. Um, just a final one, guys, because there's been some, some great questions and this has been a brilliant session. Um, what's one of the other barriers to real transformation, and this applies to both health and to the education sector, obviously, is um, the, the workload and the bureaucracy for social workers uh, and, their, and their, their, their cases, and also the class sizes. So we've got you know schools with bigger classes and stuff. So um, if we're looking at really transforming um, the, the outcome out for these children, some of the sort of inbuilt and, 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 and legacy problems we have are the large class sizes which put pressures on chill, uh, teachers to actually support individual pupils and then uh, from the health side, social workers and their caseload is is uh, certainly to my mind hasn't diminished in this in this past. So is there anything at all in the strategy that is that highlights that or, or help to assist uh, with those um, strands? Okay, if I can come in, first of all, and Robbie, so one of the things that I do want to say is the strategy isn't just about the children, it's yeah. about those who care for the children, and that includes um, social workers and teachers who work who, who work um, with them and care um, for them. So I just want to assure you um, of yeah. that. Within within health, um, you know, supporting the adapt the children strategy, we have a social work strategy, and, and that is partly um, focused on reducing unnecessary and bureaucracy within social work because some bureaucracy will always um, be um, necessary. Um, you know, things like um, the new way of working within social work, science and safety, that, that new approach again is partly about um, working differently and with families and being able to spend more direct time with families and away from the computer and the desk and back uh, in the office. So um, that's partly. Um, what that is about, and we've also made investment um, in um, social work teams, again, to hopefully reduce some of their, their um, caseloads and, again, give them the opportunity um, to work more closely and more directly um, with um, families. And, and a final thing I suppose I could refer to is um, we, we have what's called Unicini um, within, um, mm -hmm. within social um, services. It's an assessment um, framework a lot of bureaucracy attached um, to that um, too and what we're in the process of doing is to try and and strip some of the complexity out of that and some of the duplication out of that that currently exists again to reduce the bureaucracy um, for um, social workers involved with families. Thank you Alicia. Um, Thanks. Robbie, I suppose from an edu education yep. perspective, nothing specifically in terms of class sizes, more of the strategy is about um, you know, building on the successes of the pilot uh, around the key stage two children, trying to expand that, put that on a permanent footing in terms of uh, improving their educational outcomes and looking at the successes within that around um, the attached project and building the capacity of staff, including teachers who work with um, looked after children in the education sector. Um, and we know, for example, the trauma-informed spaces, which I think Anne-Marie talked about in terms of um, allowing children time uh, to regulate um, themselves within the school building. That's something that we'd want to try and build on. And also for the teachers, I think, in terms of that co-regulation was the, the phrase that Anne-Marie used. So they're the sort of things that we want to try and, and bring forward um, through implementation of the strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, guys, for two good sessions. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks, Robbie. William Humphrey. 
Thanks very much, everybody, for your presentation this afternoon. Um, can I just say it's really refreshing um, to hear of a project that has really, in practice, delivered a multi-agency approach and that joint upness that we often talk about and unfortunately don't often or see enough of. Um, and um, so I'm really encouraged by what I've heard uh, in this presentation. And I suppose, um, given that this is a pilot, uh, we would all like to see this pilot being expanded and broadened out across our constituencies. Because I think Northern Ireland and the young people uh, within our schools would certainly benefit from it, as would the teachers. Um, I mean, the early interventions are both cheaper and more cost effective. Um, Chair, you will remember way back at the start of our work last year, I suggested we have a visit to Curry Primary School. And I know because of the COVID difficulties, we haven't been able to do that. But um, I just want to read out uh, to uh, those that are listening and to our guests uh, an email that I received from the principal of Curry Primary School uh, about the Looked After Children project. Um, and it says, I just wanted to let you know that this is the best project we've had in education. It has totally transformed our practice at Curry. And you know what we do in terms of meeting the children's ed educational and emotional needs. The LAC, LAC project, along with the attached project, has had the biggest impact on us as professionals. And Amory is to be commended on building a team of professionals whose focus is to improve the life chances of the children in their care and to equip those who work with them to raise their game and make a difference. And I think we can talk about this all day, but getting a testimony like that from a school principal that has benefited from the project uh, is hugely important and significant. And I just want to thank Anne-Marie and her team for the difference that they have clearly made, uh, not just to the teaching professionals, but more importantly, the young people in the Tigers Bay and Duncan and Lower North Belfast area who have clearly benefited from this project. And I just, just really, most of the questions that I had have been been asked and addressed, but I just wanted to to say that that is for me uh, the, the 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 absolute evidence that this project has worked, has made a difference, and uh, that no doubt other schools and other communities in Northern Ireland would benefit if it was rolled out. So thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, Anne Marie, to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, William. Uh, Nicola Brogan. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, again, thanks everyone for coming in and um, for their contributions today. I just have a quick question. Ailey, you had mentioned um, in that you made a point that looked after children had a higher rate of mental ill health and maybe drugs and alcohol abuse and suicide and that. Um, how do you see the strategy working to improve the well-being of looked, looked after children? Okay, so I mean, that, that, that's the, the, the primary purpose of the strategy, and Nicola, it is about improving um, well-being, and that will include um, well-being relating um, to their um, health, both their physical health and their um, mental health. I, I mean, you are aware, I think, that um, the Department of Health is committed to bringing forward a mental health um, strategy, and um, part of that strategy will be about... Um, what we do in mental health terms for children and young people and, and within children and young people then and what we need to ensure the strategy um, sufficiently um, covers the mental health of um, after um, children and young people too and, and, and indeed to that extends to um, care labour. So we're working with other parts of the Department of Health at the minute um, to ensure that looked after children are um, sufficiently represented um, within a mental health strategy um, for um, Northern Ireland, and that work is actually ongoing um, as we speak. That's great, thank you. Um, and thanks again for all um, of your contributions. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Justin McNulty. Hi, guys. Um, thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, Ricky, Angela, um, Anne Marie, and Eilish. Um, Call this pedantic, but I just I just have a problem with uh, ac acronymizing children. And I think it's it's a it's a special uh, talent of the department to acronymize children. Uh, Sen, lack. And I think it dehuman dehumanizes them. And I think it, it takes away the 
the, the human touch from them and uh, uh, what, what what is the, the why do the people do focus on that why why are they called sane or called lack what is the why, what is the purpose of that do, does anybody feel the same as me that calling young people and children by sane or by lack it dehumanizes them Justin, I, I know that some of the engagement with children, that has been the feedback that they have provided to us uh, in both health and uh, education. And that term, lack, um, can be seen as quite negative for obvious um, reasons. So certainly within education, we've tried to change that to be about children who are looked after and try to make that more positive and not use that acronym lack. Uh, in that way. I, I never want to see another document from the department, from the education authority that uses lack or sand. I think it just totally dehumanizes children. Um, and whilst the ambition and the, the efforts are extraordinary and very positive and should be celebrated, can we please consider what my, what my thoughts are on that? So I just think it's, it's wrong. Um, just, just I'm not sure if I missed can this. I just on that point, if you, if you oh, don't sure. mind? I mean, I, I, probably just to explain it. I'm not. I'm not um, saying that it's absolutely right. I mean, it is a. It's a legislative term that has become abbreviated, um, and I think you're entirely um, right. And Ricky has re referenced it. Um, it's something that children and young people themselves um, totally object um, to, and I think there is an onus on us all um, going forward, particularly um, in connection with this strategy. Um, to remove any references in future to um, the terminology of, of, of lack. I'm completely with you on that point. Okay. I think it's something that should be agreed on, you know, across the department on a mental basis. When you're talking about children, you're talking about children, you're not abbreviating them. Because yes. it, it just makes, it turns my stomach to read that in any report in relation to children, where they're being abbreviated and uh, acronymized. I think it's wrong. It shouldn't yeah. happen. So I think that's something that should be brought forward by this committee to ensure that any children across departmental departments cannot be abbreviated because it, it just diminishes their importance. Every child is important. Um, what, what, in terms of the figures, the, the, up, the, up, the increase in the figures of uh, children who are looked after over the last number of years, what, what's your explanation as to why that has actually happened? Okay, I mean, I, I want to provide an, an answer, I think, in response to um, Daniel's question, um, Justin, I think there are probably a number of reasons um, for it. I am particularly attaching it to things like um, levels of um, deprivation. Um, but, you know, there, there, there is also something about um, parenting and, 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 and helping people to parent um, well too, which is um, one of the reasons why we're bringing forward a family and parenting um, support strategy um, so that parents and families are um, equipped to and supported um, to undertake the very important role of um, parenting, very important role and very difficult role of, uh, of parenting. So I think there's a number of things that we still um, need to do and, that, what, and we're intending um, to do. Um, to um, support families and um, to stay um, together, but but we can't ignore um, levels of deprivation and that um, that I do think um, have an impact on, on on families being able and um, to stay together. Okay, well, you think yeah, I think it is uh, should be noted that it's, it's a sad uh, indictment of society that is happening. But at the same time, I do recognise a comment you made earlier that some of these children and young people need to be celebrated, and they're not. They're not uh, lost causes. They're not something that should be um, spoken down enough. Uh, they're, they're wonderful young people. And how are they celebrated in terms of officially recognising the achievement of these young people to come through the upbringing that they've come through and then to come out the other end and be, be pillars in society, to, to get good jobs, to get their education, to um, become important members of the community? How is that recognised and, and uh, Celebrate this. and you know I applaud people like Robbie Butler, who is a foster care and, and plays his part. And I applaud that that role, the part, the role of parents in that regard, and teachers and people in the community who help bring these young people through. How is it recognised and celebrated on a yearly or six monthly or annual you know, basis to mark how determined, how resilient, how important these people are to our communities? And I think I've referenced it already, and Justin, you know that's 
partly what Care Day um, is about, you know, so it's now um, an annual event. Um, so around February um, every year, um, Care Day takes place um, across um, the UK, including in Northern Ireland, um, led by the um, Voice of um, Young People um, in Care. Um, and Care Day events are supported across government and um, by all government um, departments, and they are principally about what you've asked us um, to do, celebrating um, some of the successes of children and young people in care, and to undo what Robbie um, referred to, um, you know, to undo the, the, the stigma um, that attaches um, to um, being in care and helping people understand exactly what being in care um, actually um, means. So, I mean, it has become an annual um, event. I mean, the other thing that we do is, um, and I think this is, you know, it, it is, it's as important as celebrating, it's giving children and young people in care their place, you know, so increasingly we involve them in decision making and we have four um, that make that um, possible, certainly within health social care trusts. And there will be four that um, children and young people participate um, in um, to give them a voice and to give them a, a say and to help them influence um, decisions that are made um, about them. So in addition to celebrating, I think it's equally important um, to give them um, a voice. Yeah, I think the strength of these young people to uh, come through um, as without the traditional upbringing of a nuclear, nuclear family is extraordinary. And that's something that we should really, really recognize and it's it's, it's a hugely admirable and not there's nothing something it's definitely not something that should be stigmatized and so fully agree Elish. um justin, justin can i just come in there to say sorry justin in terms of the project we have we have witnessed an awful lot of celebrations within the schools in key stage two we have some right. really incredible schools out there that do some fantastic work in terms of celebrating achievements for, for children looked after and indeed all uh, children, all children, but there's a lot of a lot of celebrations going on out there with their achievements. That's fantastic, and you're doing great work uh, in that regard. I'm, I'm really and well done. Just touching on something with the uh, which Robin mentioned earlier, and it relates to the pandemic and looked after children and at risk children. How do you feel this pandemic has impacted on care for looked after children and at risk children? Um, I, 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 I mean, I've already said it, um, Justin, and, and it's borne out by the numbers. Um, you know, we've had increases in the numbers of referrals and the numbers of child protection referrals and the number of children on the child protection registers. You know, so clearly the pandemic has had um, a very serious impact. Um, and, um, you know, I think it, it will make um, the challenge going forward even um, greater. Um, you know, we already had difficulties um, um, within um, looked after children um, services. Um, you know, those difficulties have just, just got um, greater, and we're just going to have to work our way um, through that um, in the future. But absolutely, um, the pandemic has had an impact, and, and the numbers bear that out. Are you adequately, adequately resourced uh, to be able to tackle those um, increase in numbers because of the, of the pandemic? You know, so there ha there have been additional investments um, made in services um, throughout the pandemic, and I've referred to some of them um, today. Extra support for um, foster carers, extra support um, within um, children's homes, extra support um, uh, within um, uh, the unaccompanied um, children um, system, and um, too. You know, so there are a number of pressure points, and we've sought to uh, make additional uh, investments. Um, in those areas um, over the course of the um, pandemic and, and, and hopefully that will go some way um, to, to helping us on the other side of, of the pandemic. So in answer to your question, do we have enough money? We, 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 we sought money and we obtained um, money and where we thought it was necessary um, to make investments. Okay, forgive me, uh, that's a bit of a euphemism to, to say that there are, it's a bit of a euphemism to say that there are pressure points. We're talking about children. Are there children who are being failed and who are not safe as a consequence of this pandemic and, and not having adequate resources there to help to look out for them? No, I, I wouldn't say that. When I, when I talk in terms of pressure points, I don't mean children, I mean pressure points within services um, rather um, than in connection um, with individual um, children or children um, generally. So uh, forgive me if, if I misled you um, on that um, point. 
there have been pressures on services and we sought um, to address those um, pressures by um, making additional investments. Well, can I applaud, can I applaud the work of you and your colleagues? Given the pressure points you're experiencing, can I applaud the really important work you've all been undertaking, especially given the context and the, the, the risks associated with this pandemic? So well done to you all, guys, and best of luck going forward. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Ricky, just in closing, can I uh, supplement Justin's question in relation to resources and, and to ask what additional resources have been allocated to support the educational attainment of care experienced children during the COVID-19 pandemic? So there was a project uh, that was formed uh, and led by the EA in relation to well-being um, and people support services, including for children with special educational needs, which looked at um, how the EA would <clears throat> restart services, maintain services, and what level of additional support would be um, required. So I know that Anne-Marie and her team within the EA did um, maintain a very high level of service um, with the children that they um, had been supporting. I don't have figures in front of me in terms of um, the amount of money that was um, provided to, to the EA, but that's something I would need to come back on. Okay. And how will those young people be supported to complete curriculum and assessment this year? Um, well, I think you mentioned, Chair, the Engage programme uh, previously, so that would probably be the, the department's primary policy response in terms of levels of lost learning. So I think that programme is currently being ruled out and will, of course, include children who are looked after. Okay. Ricky, uh, Robin Newton wants to ask a brief supplementary. Uh, just a brief supplementary, and thank you, Chair. Um, when I raised the issue about the disparate approach from St Mary's, Queen's, the University of Ulster and Stranmillis, you seem to agree that a, a consistent approach was, was required. Would you welcome, if the committee was minded, to write to each of the teaching institutions in, in support of a consistent approach to uh, the uh, inclusion of uh, um, whatever the various subjects are uh, for, for these children? Oh, that would be very helpful. We would welcome that, yes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. I'd say something about integrating our teacher training system, but uh, that, that's, a, that's a step in the right direction, integrating our teacher training for uh, care experienced children. Um, Ricky, Angela, Amory, Eilish, can I uh, say sincere thank you for your briefing today, for all the work that you're doing on behalf of care experienced children. Um, there is clearly serious work to be done to improve the support and outcomes um, for these children. Uh, and this committee will continue to work with you towards that aim. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Clark, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all witnesses and add all members back into the spotlight and keep them there until the end of the meeting and ask you to summarise any actions or requests for additional information resulting from the briefing? Thank you. Thanks, Chairperson. I think if I've uh, picked up members correctly, um, the uh, one right to the department um, welcoming the new strategy, in particular the joined upness, the uh, looked after children champion, um, the, um, the key stage two pilot, um, perhaps encouraging uh, the department to engage with the initial teacher education providers about looked after children teaching. I would be conscious that that. Um, research paper is actually pretty old, so um, maybe something about that. Additionally, perhaps encouraging um, the development of the, the targets, the report card that was mentioned, and also possibly, if I've read members correctly, they would encourage the department to ensure that the looked after children champion is a permanent role and there'll be more of them. Um, additionally, then seeking clarity, uh, looking for the independent evaluation of the key stage two pilots asking Mr Newton's question about the alternative education provision post-school. Also, just seeking clarity if indeed the 14 to 19 strategy will include looked after children. I'm not sure either way, to be honest. Also seeking sight of the implementation plan, which is mentioned in the strategy, and the children's rights assessments um, for the strategy. And also just seeking clarity about the, um, 
uh, whether their personal education plans are indeed to become statutory and following up on the chairperson's question asking about the additional resources for care experienced children during the pandemic and how they would be supported to undertake curriculum and assessment and then finally writing to St Mary's Stramillus University College Univ Ulster University as they like to be called and QUB asking them to update on um, what their teacher training colleges actually do, their teacher training courses do, in respect of looked after children and encouraging them to uh, you know, adopt a, a joined up approach uh, to ensure that uh, you know, um, these are trauma informed, which I bet they are, uh, that uh, teachers are able to you know, identify the needs and how these children would present and to be able to, uh, to help them appropriately and to sorry, copy our response to the department to the health committee as they have this strategy to chairperson members anything missing there? Yeah, sure. Justin, go ahead. To the Department on the Education Authority, uh, encouraging them to stop acronymizing okay. children and young people. Okay. okay. Members, okay. members content to agree that those actions? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed, thank Agreed. you. Okay, Clark, I move to agenda item seven, correspondence, and ask if you'd speak to this item. Chairperson, as time is a wasting, um, what I would suggest members is that we go to page 359, um, where there is a uh, summary indicating what the correspondence was and suggesting how it be disposed. And I would suggest that um, we dispose as per the note, just with the exception of the last one, which is at page 387. Here, Holy Trinity College had written back um, asking for a virtual meeting to discuss exam concerns. Mm -hmm. The committee has the minister next week. Um, I'm not sure what the minister is going to come and say. I don't want to raise the expectations, but he has said a few times that uh, the department is working with SIA about contingencies for exams, and they're close to being able to tell us something. Don't know if that will happen um, this day next week, but perhaps after that, um, give consideration to whether you want to undertake um, uh, a further um, a Zoom event. Uh, with uh, with schools uh, on the subject of uh, examinations and uh, the pandemic, chairperson. Yeah, c content to see what the education minister has to say next week, but that that item be kept on there to okay. make sure that we do respond proactively to any of those requests for meetings. Members content with that? Yeah. yeah. Just on, yeah, on that, it, I just find it very concerning and worrying that we're now in the December and we still don't have that detail, and it's. Uh, when you're meeting with students, um, schools, unions, the anxiety levels, because the expectation is that that will be produced before now. So I hope by next Wednesday it definitely is, and that certainty and clarity can be given to schools and students and parents and what the rollout of the examinations is going to look like. Great. Yep. And members are then therefore content to dispose of the other correspondence as per the covering note, if that's okay. Agreed, members. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, much. members. Agenda item eight is forward work program. Can I refer you to the draft forward work program at page three eight nine, and advise members that in line with last week's decision, uh, briefing from the Youth Work Alliance, Uniform Hub, and Network Youth, and I. Yeah, that's, are, that's the yeah. covering organisation. Okay. It's not Youth Network. Uh, okay. <laughs> are to be arranged for the thirteenth of January. Members content that we take those briefings in, in one sitting, um, as those organisations will be relatively familiar with each other and have a degree of crossover on issues. Members content with that approach, yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, Chairperson, that will probably be a busy session anyway. There's usually a ton of correspondence from over uh, Christmas. Uh, okay. So, you're worrying about Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Can I also seek uh, committee agreement to add a briefing from Autism NI on ASD mandatory teacher training in the new year? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Yeah. And can I advise members that the Department of Health, Department of Education, Education Authority briefed the committee on the Educational Department of Health led consultation on the COVID 19 Vulnerable Children Support Plan on the 18th of November? The, official, the officials uh, didn't provide any information on the feedback to the consultation or the planned way forward. So, are uh, members content to invite officials to return and brief on the feedback to this important consultation? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Um, Clark, am I right in saying we had intended to add a, a 
planning day for the committee? We do, yeah. and that's currently showing We've got that in on the schedule. Sixth of January. So I would intend to attend that one with your new Clark Avian trainer. That that that'd be a timely way to approach that. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. And, and we effective questioning that day too. So okay. So that's sixth of January. If members are okay. Right. So we'll phone round you and make sure that you're content to attend either virtually or um, otherwise. In or okay. Yeah. Members content to endorse the. Sorry. Don't want to come in there. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Just a bite, yep. I don't know what's wrong with us today. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure the rest of you are the same. I'm receiving a huge amount of correspondence from uh, teachers and parents and principals about schools remaining open, so close to Christmas, and the risks that poses to families that uh, uh, they're going home to. That's a uh, we, we need to do something. On this, I can understand the data. I was going to call the number of principals across West Drone after the session. And secondly, uh, exams. Um, the minister is adamant to continue to this path, and the anxiety levels in schools are through the roof. Uh, there is no certainty whatsoever about what's been happening with examinations, but one thing is clear. They absolutely cannot go ahead as planned, so the minister is better acting now under pressure from us or uh, facing the consequences uh, of a complete disaster uh, similar to that in the summer. Yeah, Daniel, I think that's why the session next week with the Minister is obviously of such importance. So you'd be glad to raise those issues, as will many of the rest of us at that session. Um, members otherwise content to endorse the Forward Work Programme as agreed? Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Uh, in terms of any uh, other business members, chair, sorry, yeah. yes, Robbie. Chair, yeah, I wonder uh, any other business. But I suppose it maybe had something to do with the, the forward work plan. Tuesday mornings just do not work for me. Um, they really, I, I can never sit through session if we have a, a meeting on a Tuesday morning from half nine to half ten. So uh, you said before about alternative times. Thursday mornings certainly, or sometime on a Thursday would suit me much better. Uh, for those, but going forward, I, I to be honest, I just be under too much pressure on a Tuesday. Understand. Um, I need magic powers to find a slot that worked for everybody outside of the allotted time. But at fair point, um, heated. Maybe it's something that we can consider at the planning day. Whether there there is a a better time that maximises members' attendance. On that note, Robbie. In terms of any other business, um, we have a an important uh, Zoom saying stakeholder session this Thursday, the 2nd of December uh, at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Members content that we extend the invitation to the Special School Strategic Leadership Group and a representative from Belfast Special Schools? Agreed? Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, do members have any other business? Yes. Nope. Justin? Yes, Chair. Go ahead. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Just to supplement what Daniel was saying, lots of parents and teachers and principals have been in touch with me about the uncertainty around uh, the Christmas holidays. Uh, they're worried that children will, will not be able to spend time with the families because potentially um, contracting COVID in that week previous to Christmas. They're really worried about that. And on the other hand, there are parents of children with special education needs or complex needs who are really, really concerned about an early closure. There's been mixed messages from the minister. The minister has made provisions for school meals, free school meals from the 14th. So has he, is that a contingency plan for from the minister? We need certainty on that matter pronto. And um, that has to happen next week at least. Agreed. I think that's been made clear by the committee today, um, the need for clarity on, on those issues. Um, any other business? No. Okay, members, then that meeting is scheduled for next Wednesday, the 9th of December, in room 30 at 9.30 a.m. The committee does now adjourn. Members. This is the Northern Ireland Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.